for you. I'm here, but I don't know where I fit, you know, figure <laughs> on your screen. <laughs> I know, I'm looking for you. <laughs> ah, la, 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 la. That's so weird. Um, we'll just take a moment to uh, let everybody arrive. Well, oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> So happy to see you, Sharon. Hi. So we'll just wait a minute or two, and then it is my great joy to introduce Sharon. Well, it seems that everybody's here, and I really want to thank everybody for being prompt. Um, it's not the case for my sitting group on Sunday mornings. <laughs> people trickle in and it's very relaxed but for you for our eminent teacher Sharon everybody's on time I'm happy to say and I'm very happy to introduce you so I'm Trudy I'm the founder of Inside LA and I am probably I may be the only person here who has heard Sharon teach since she was 23 years old uh, she was a clear and a uh, very clear and wonderful teacher back then, although now, of course, you tell the story about being stricken with fear about teaching back then, which I can certainly relate to, but it didn't show. She was a wonderful teacher back then, and I have had the really uh, joy of watching over the years Sharon's teaching transform from the very classical teachings to include uh, more mainstream teachings and be able to address people from all walks of life with all levels of experience and trauma and so forth. Uh, Sharon is a prolific writer and has published uh, how many books now? Uh, numbers 12 and 13 are going to come out next year. What are they called so we can eagerly await them? Do you know yet? One, one, yeah, one is called Real Life. It's like oh, right. an actual book. The other is In Search of a Title. So if anyone wants something to obsess about all day as we practice, you can help <laughs> me find a book title. It, it's a, a, like a gift book, which means it's illustrated as little short essays or short poems or things like that. And it was originally called... Um, drop by drop, like drop of wisdom by drop of wisdom. And a friend just said to me on Zoom yesterday, that's like torture, you know, like drip and drip, drip, drip. And then anyway, the publisher doesn't like it. So it's a book in search of a title. Okay. Okay. Well, everybody has something, uh, a koan to work on today. <laughs> the title for Sharon's new book. Anyway, I, you know, Sharon is a clear and wonderful writer. I recommend all her books to you and yeah, buy them all. And, uh, and also Sharon was one of the very, the very first uh, teacher of her stature and standing to come and teach at Inside LA at the very beginning which actually helped so much and i've been grateful to you ever since and you've been a loyal um, ally and supporter of our work all along at inside la and especially insight in action our work out in the community so with that um i could go on and on but you're here to hear you're here to hear to listen to sharon teach and i will um quietly continue to sing your praises and look forward to uh, being with you part of the day today. I have um, another teaching actually to attend um, later, but yeah, thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much for being here and thank you everybody for being here together today. Well, thank you. I already got a book title. <laughs> Fantastic. A steady stream, that's very nice. Because it also dream. you know indicates what the cover art should look like. I Thank do you. like that. Yeah. The funny part of that story actually is that um because there are all these short pieces, the subtitle was uh 108 
something of wisdom, you know. Um, and this is like, this is indicative of pandemic thinking. I woke up one morning and I thought, of course, 108 is like a, a sacred number in Buddhism and Hinduism. But I woke up one morning and I thought, why make it 108? You can say 60 and then you're done. And that's what I did. <laughs> so uh, why hold to some old standard? You actually could be done with this book. So there it is. It's also in search of a subtitle. Um, I'm just delighted to be with you all. It's so much fun to think about the evolution of time, the passage of time, and uh, that early retreat for Inside LA. I remember being some extremely funky place. <laughs> didn't have walls or didn't have a room. It didn't have something that you really wanted in a very windy day. Um, and here we are on Zoom. Uh, if you feel like it, you're welcome to write in the chat where you're calling in from. Actually, you know, keep thinking you're all in LA, except for me, which of course may not be the case. Um, so as we, uh, yeah, so please, if you feel like it, you can write where you're, you're dialing in from in the chat. We're gonna be together for a couple of hours before a longer break, which one might call the lunch break, depending on where you are. And then coming back uh, together uh, subsequent to that for a, a longer chunk of time. Look, you're from everywhere. You're all over the place. New Zealand, very early morning. Well, good morning. Um, Buffalo, where are you? New York. I went to college in Buffalo, New York. Sharon, where are you right now? I'm at the moment. I'm in New York City, which might become obvious with street sounds. It's hard to say. Um, I have been going back and forth between Barry, Massachusetts, where the Insight Meditation Society is, and uh, Australia, woo, and, and New York City, where uh, I have a, a small rental apartment. And um, yeah, I mean, I was, as one knows, you know, coming off of like two years of a very unexpected life. So um, I'm spending a little bit more time in New York these days. Um, look at this, Costa Rica, Toronto. You really are all everywhere. So Nashville, stop me if I say morning or afternoon because it won't really figure. So. I got excited about the prospect of our practicing together here today and talking about really skills of meditation and exploring those together. Uh, because from the first acquaintance I ever had with meditation practice, it was described as a skills training. Um, my first meditation teacher was SN Goenka. This was in, in India, Borgaya, India, in January of 1971 was my first retreat. And uh, Gwenka had just left Burma a little while before and was just beginning his teaching career. And the very first night of my first retreat, he said, the Buddha did not teach Buddhism, the Buddha taught a way of life. And so this is like my introduction. This is my first night. So it really became a pillar of my own understanding and perspective. Um, and he went on to describe basically meditation practice as a skills training, saying, you, you know, it's really not about a belief system. It's not about assuming another identity. It's not about rejecting anything else. Um, it's really about the power of one's own awareness and developing it, cultivating it. The word that we translate as meditation from Pali, the language of the original Buddhist texts, is bhavana, B-H-A-V-A-N-A. -A -A. It literally means cultivation. And so the image is really like cultivating the ground. We're cultivating the ground so that the things we want, insight, clarity, 
perspective, love, connection can emerge. And this is a little different than maybe our normal, more grabby mentality. Like if I have a big insight before the lunch break, I'd have to come back, you know, something like that. We're creating the conditions, we're cultivating the ground. It also implies a certain kind of patience. It's like, we're gonna do our part and let nature take its course. This is a place where I, I sometimes talk about my, my friend, my colleague, Joseph Goldstein, who describes growing his first and I believe his only garden. He was about nine years old and he says that he got so impatient when the little green fluffy stuff started coming up on top of the carrots that he'd yank them up to help them grow faster. So of course he didn't have much of a harvest, which perhaps is why it was his only garden ever. You know, so even that image, the cultivating the ground, it, it has a certain feeling tone to it. Allowing, doing our part for sure, but then letting things unfold because there's nothing else we can realistically do. In some schools of Tibetan Buddhism, um, they have a phrase I always found very cute uh, to describe meditation, whatever the word is in Tibetan that we would translate as a meditation. In this particular school, they use this phrase, getting used to it, getting familiar with it. So that of course brings up the question, what's it that we're getting familiar with? And this is based on a belief that as a human being having a human life, we have had profound moments of clarity, of connection, of belonging, of caring, but we don't tend to be awfully used to them. We don't tend to live there. So we practice meditation to make a home out of the clearest experiences we have had, but we've had them. You know, so sometimes when we think about meditation with either of these images, it's kind of a desperate feeling like I've got nothing going and I somehow have to make balance happen or, or calm happen. But we've had these experiences. We don't tend to live there. You know, great art will bring us there or uh, love can bring us there. Or sometimes a lot of suffering can bring us there because everything else has been kind of grinded away. We don't tend to live there. And sometimes, you know, we have one of these experiences and we think, what was that, you know? Or I don't think I'll tell anyone about that. Or I think I'll tell everyone about that. Or mostly, I don't know how to get back there. So here's a system of skills so we can in effect return. The, you know, as I said, both those images are really meant to almost kind of reassure us that meditation is not like this odious task and a struggle. We're either getting used to some place that maybe we only glimpsed, or another way of saying it is we're cultivating the ground. We're creating the conditions so that the life changes, the, the effects, the fruits that we want can emerge and they will emerge uh, when we cultivate the ground in that way. So there clearly there are lots of types, and styles and methods of meditation. I'm gonna uh, you know, talk about just a couple, we can do them together. There's gonna be lots of time for discussion or questions. Um, so even though Goenka was so reassuring to me that I didn't have to call myself a Buddhist or reject anything else, uh, because it's been so many years of my practicing within that context, this is the language, the, 
uh, the idiom, the stories that I'm most used to and most comfortable expressing. So I'll often say something like, well, in the Buddhist psychology, blah, blah, blah. You know, but that doesn't mean it's limited there. I believe it's limited there or that um, there aren't like lots and lots of other ways of expressing it. And as Trudy said, it's kind of fun, uh, you know, in some way to just use modern psychology or, or other modes of expression, other, other modes of description. Uh, but this is the one that you'll hear me use a lot because it's one I'm, I'm most uh, familiar with since 1971 was a good long time ago now, um, speaking of the passage of time. Um, so one way, I'm sure, you know, some of you are very, very experienced meditators, this would be very repetitious for you, but that too is something uh, I'm used to, like uh, all of my teachers, how, all of my meditation teachers have been Asian. And there's something about Asian monastic or spiritual pedagogy, which is all about repetition. Like if you don't hear this 50,000 times, you haven't heard it. So bear with me. It's very different than in the West, you know, we have a premium on being entertained or novelty or something like that. Um, and for some of you perhaps never even practiced meditation on all before, and that's fine. Uh, the principles are really well, it's interesting, and those hold true no matter what experience we're having. Like sometimes people say to me, uh, it's almost like we think of it like a college course or you know, that's, that's 101. When are you going to give the really sophisticated, elaborate, exciting new instructions? And I think, well, I've been doing the same thing for 50 years. No one's ever given them to me, you know. Um, it's not exactly like that. We change, our experience changes all of the time. That doesn't mean the method has to get fancy or any fancier than it was to begin with. It's a practice. Uh, and it's about our own practice. I was quoting one of my uh, other early teachers, this man named Meninger the other day, where um, he said to me, uh, the Buddha's enlightenment solved the Buddha's problem. Now you solve yours. And it entered me in such a way, it felt like maybe the first time in my life someone was looking at me as though to say you can solve your problem you can solve the problem of the confusion and the the fragmentation the inner chaos that's brought you here to india to begin with you can do that and that's kind of the whole point you know even though um we may have a Buddha image, as you know, Trudy has a lovely tonka behind her Buddha. Uh, when we look at the Buddha, we really see ourselves. That's the whole point. We see the capacity of a human being to grow, to change, to love, to have understanding. And it means something about us in terms of that capacity. And it's not a kind of personal capacity. You know, like the Buddha and I were fine, everyone else is lost. Uh, it's a universal capacity in that seed form where it said that it is never ever destroyed our ability to change, to grow, to learn, to love. It may be way covered over and it usually is and hard to find and hard to trust, but it's there and that's the basis on which we meditate that we all have that capacity and it's not going anywhere. Um, I was also recently telling someone the story about uh, in 1976, we established the retreat center, the Insight Meditation Society. And in 1979, we heard that the Dalai Lama was basically coming to the neighborhood uh, he was coming to Amherst Mass, which is 
45 minutes away. Some of you have written in from Western Mass, you know, like 45 minutes is in the neighborhood um, as far as we calculate distance. And uh, we heard he was coming to Amherst College. He was to give some talks. It was, I believe, his first trip to the US. So we were very young, very naive. And, and we wrote a letter to the private office. And we said, well, maybe he'd like to visit us too. And then we got a letter back saying, yeah, he'll come. So there are many stories about that day that we have to tell, including, um, you know, we, we gave him lunch and a tour and all that. And then uh, we had a retreat that was happening anyway. And we brought the Dalai Lama into the meditation hall for him to give a talk and then do questions. So this was a question. This young man said, um, I've been meditating for about two weeks now, because that's how long the retreat had been going on. I've been meditating for about two weeks and I've decided I can't do it. I don't have any ability to concentrate. I can't settle my mind. Other people may, and throughout history, maybe people have had that ability. I can't do it. It's not gonna work for me. And this was, I really do think, the Dalai Lama's first trip to North America. And he got this very puzzled look on his face. And he said, you're wrong. You're just wrong. And he went on to talk about, you know, within that system, the belief in what they might call Buddha nature or that seed form that capacity, that ability, which is considered universal and indestructible, no matter what we may go through. He said, you're wrong. And it was so funny because so many people came up to me after that and said, that's bad pedagogy. You should never tell anyone they're wrong. I can't believe he said that. He was like, you know, it was such a mistake, except for the young man he'd been talking to, for whom it had been like the perfect thing to say, you know, and who stayed on and finished the retreat. And so um, every once in a while, I say to myself, or I think, you're wrong, you're just wrong, when you believe it's impossible. That's not to say meditation is always blissful, or that we aren't breaking new ground or stepping into unfamiliar terrain, we are very often. And in a way it's opening to everything. Um, the beautiful, joyful experiences that we might actually in ordinary times, an ordinary day feel we don't deserve or we're too distracted to even notice. We don't get replenished or nourished by because we're not taking them in. And the neutral, experiences, just kind of ordinary, not very pleasant or unpleasant. They're just happening and we're bored or we're numb or something like that. And we learn to actually connect and the painful experiences, uh, physical pain, emotional pain, just in the natural course of life of a day, we go there. And rather than feeling uh, ashamed or or guilty or um, in denial, being in denial, we can open to those as well. So it's really everything. Uh, everything is natural to experience in the course of meditation. It doesn't mean you need remedial work if your experience is painful um, or you're doing it wrong. This is kind of the whole point. So the foundational exercise in most systems of meditation have to do with being able to stabilize our attention a little bit. Most of us experience ourselves as pretty scattered or distracted. Not maybe in every arena of life, but at least in some. You sit down to think something through and you're gone. Our minds jump to the past and we go over 
and over and over and over some situation. Often they say one where we now have some regret. But we don't go over it in a useful way, like with an eye toward lessons learned or how to make amends. We just go over it and over it and over it and over it. And or, and I'd say especially in our time, it's an and, our minds jump to the future and we create a scenario that has not happened and may never happen. And we're filled with anxiety about that. You know, what if I get in the car to go back to Barry and the car breaks down? Like, huh? And then I'm going to be stranded on the side of the road. And then, uh, you know. Um, so we lose such a tremendous amount of our life energy, just throwing it away like that. So often the foundational exercise, not like the ultimate approach, but something we keep coming back to. I hesitate even to use the word foundational because, again, it might imply well, that's 101. I did that last year. You know, now I'm on to bigger and better things. We always go back to it and kind of nurture it and strengthen it and then move out again <clears throat> and then come back. So it's usually about that gathering, that foundational exercise to steady our attention a little bit, to have a sense of being centered. So we actually can observe the various things that come and go without being so enmeshed in them, to be able to realize I'm way out, you know, in space and come back. So there's a big element of learning how to let go gracefully and returning, starting over with kindness toward ourselves instead of rancor and judgment. That's the foundational exercise. So we commonly do that by choosing an object of awareness, settling our attention on that object, seeing our attention has gone somewhere else, and as much as possible without judgment, seeing if we can let go. It's what one of my teachers once called exercising the letting go muscle. We see if we can let go and come back. We let go and we return. We let go and we begin again. And that's why it's considered meditation of that type is considered like a resilience exercise. That's what we're strengthening. And it sounds really simplistic. And many of you have heard me say, no doubt. When I was at that first retreat and I heard those instructions, like, in our situation, we use the breath, resting the attention on the breath and coming back to it when we were lost. And I thought, that is so stupid. You know, why'd I come all the way here? I'll do that. But it's not that easy to do, in fact. And we'll go into that. Um, and it doesn't have to get fancier, like I was saying before. It also doesn't need to be the feeling of the breath. We have an object we choose. It could be a mantra, it could be a sound, it could be an image, it could be a prayer, it could be something else happening in your body. Um, but we have an object of awareness. The important word, an important word in that is rest. When I, I wrote an earlier book, um, uh, Real Happiness, and, and that had, um, a lot of guided meditations in it. And when that came back from the editor, one of the things she said was, you're using the word rest a lot, are you very tired? And I wrote back and I said, well, probably, but that's also the word. That's not that easy, you know, that's a skill in itself. Let's say it's the feeling of the breath. We often think if I get a, like a strangle hold on the breath, my mind won't wander and it actually will wander more. So we rest. The example sometimes used of resting one's attention lightly, like a butterfly resting on a flower. 
And then crucially, whatever that object is, that central object, our attention will wander or will fall asleep. Something will happen. And then we need to practice letting go and coming back, which is really the crucial skill of that form of meditation because it, it translates into life, into daily life, really immediately. Because think about it, how many times a day do we need to start over or do a course correction or shift, right? A lot of times a day. We fall down, we have to get up or help, let someone else help us up, we start over. We make a mistake, we have to begin again. Or we spend like a month and a half blaming ourselves for having made the mistake and we're exhausted, we're demoralized and we haven't like picked up again, right? So it's a really crucial skill. We have an object, it doesn't have to be the breath. Commonly in this system of practice, it is the breath. In part, um, as uh, my early teachers would say, it's universal. You don't have to believe anything to feel your breath. You don't have to call yourself a Buddhist or a Hindu or reject anything else. If you're breathing, you can be meditating. And then one went on to say, I always felt very charmingly, said the breath is very portable. <clears throat> you know, let's say you practice, let's say 12 minutes a day, 12 to 20 minutes a day sitting in a formal dedicated way. Then you're commuting or you're at work or if you're working at somebody's the home or you're on a Zoom, whatever it is, and someone's getting angry and you're starting to get anxious, you can just take a few breaths and again, center, land back where you are. And one of the things I appreciate about it so much is that it's totally private. You don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to look weird. You don't need equipment. Nobody has to know you're doing it, right? But in that act of returning to the breath, returning to the moment, you're also returning to your values. You're returning to what you really care about. And so it's, it's really very important to just have that skill, whatever we're coming back to. And, you know, I'm told for a lot of people in these times of COVID and, you know, the breath actually is not working for a lot of people, a lot more people. It always didn't work, except people, and that's fine. Um, really, it's okay if it's something else. It's not like lesser or, or not as good, truly. You might think about something that is portable listening to sounds, sensations somewhere else in your body. Um, some people, like in Burma, they, they suggest um, like this rotation. You notice, even if your eyes are closed, what you're seeing. And sometimes the little patterns of light or something. You notice what you're seeing. You notice what you're hearing. You kind of flash on your whole body. You feel like your posture sitting and then maybe some touch points area about the size of a you know a quarter uh, that coin where your body's already in contact your hands are touching or maybe your hands are touching your knee or whatever um and then you go back to seeing here that just gives you uh, some alternatives um, but we have an object of awareness. We rest our attention, our minds go everywhere. We let go and we come back. So this isn't, as I said, the be all and end all of meditation practice, but it's like establishing a more stable foundation. And we come back to it when we feel we need that. Um, Sometimes this is described as concentration practice. In contrast to insight practice, insight practice, for insight practice, the engine is more what we would call mindfulness. In that with 
practices that are largely designed to deepen concentration, that gathering, you're not all that interested in what comes up aside from that central object. Whereas in mindfulness practice, if something becomes predominant, other than say the feeling of the breath, uh, an image, an emotion, a sensation, you would spend some time paying attention to that and cultivating the strength of mindfulness, which we'll talk about later. That, that's one way of kind of discerning some differentiation. So for example, uh, in my early practice where we were using the sensation of the in and out breath at the nostrils um, in that particular course, um, I developed my own form of meditation, uh, which I will share with you freely. Yeah, I never trademarked it. Um, in that uh, sometimes we use mental noting as well. So as you're feeling the sensation of the in and out breath, you may be silently in your mind repeating in, out, in, out, which helps point our attention to what the direct experience is right there. And then sometimes we use a mental note as we're practicing mindfulness if some other experience becomes predominant. So we'll talk about that also a little later. You might be noting in, out, in, out, thinking, thinking, joy, sorrow, something like that. So I decided back in the day that I was gonna just use two mental notes. One was breath. Breath, 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 breath. The other was not breath. And that was very important for me because I was hugely judgmental. You know, I was 18 years old. I, I never really practiced introspection. Like I knew I was really unhappy, but I didn't understand sort of the emotional landscape I was living in within. and. So it was like, everything was like a big revelation and kind of shocking. And as some of you also have heard me say, I was I'm somewhat famous amongst this group of friends for having marched up to Goenka, my first teacher, and saying, I never used to be an angry person before I started meditating, thereby laying blame exactly where I felt it belonged, which was on him. Clearly it was all his fault. And of course, I'd been usually angry, but I hadn't seen it. And so, all of this stuff was coming up. I didn't like any of it. And it was just lost in this field of judgment. And finally, I devised this meditation practice because it didn't matter if it was the most disgusting thought in the world or the most beautiful thought in the world. It was like, not breath. It didn't matter if it was the most welcome emotion or the one I would never want to admit to ever, ever feeling, not breath. Uh, and I say that, not that you have to do that precise practice, but that's the flavor of a practice that is largely dedicated to concentration. Our goal, if we can do it, sometimes we can't because what comes up is so intense, but if we can do it, our goal is to let go of everything that's not the central object and come back. We don't have to feel hasty or judgmental, but nonetheless, that's the that's the gesture that, that we're cultivating. When something is more intense when it arises or we're um, more thinking about a, a mindfulness practice, which is more comprehensive, then we would, as I said, include the thing that's not the breath, paying attention to that in as balanced a way as we can with as much presence as we can. We'll, we'll talk about that later. So why don't we like stretch, get comfortable. We'll do a sitting um, 
in concentration together. I don't know if you feel you need an actual break at this point, but you can let me know if you do, and we'll certainly have one. Okay. Okay, so um, how long we sit, I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's a little bit arbitrary um, in that uh, different systems will suggest different things. I have, I have many friends actually these days who are neuroscientists studying meditation, one of whom is, is this woman, Amishi Jha, who has a lab at University of Miami. Um, and her lab has, has found, and she, she's just written a book about it, uh, 12 minutes a day or three to five times a week will actually bring about measurable and um, important changes in one's happiness and so on. So I always say to Amishi, I don't know if it's that healthy to go for the bare minimum. You know, like you might pad that a little bit, like just see if you can make it 20. But it's very interesting that people, you know, nobody's saying you have to do this 17 hours a day before you see any effects in your life. Um, other neuroscientists say nine minutes a day, seven minutes a day. Um, but I would, if you can extend that somewhat without feeling like it's gotta be, you know, a ridiculous amount of your day. And also I've said to Amishi, like for me, I think self-knowledge is a very good tool if you're thinking about establishing or renewing your meditation practice. Like I've said to Amishi many times, for me, three to five times a day a week doesn't work because it'll be Monday and I'll think, I'll start on Wednesday. Then it'll be Wednesday and I'll think, I'll do it three times on Saturday, then it's done and I'll never do it. But every day is every day. So knowing that about myself, um, if I'm in a period of wanting to make that kind of commitment or experimentation, I'll say, okay, 20 minutes a day or five minutes a day, every day, because that just works for me. So uh, I'd say if you don't have 12 minutes, if you have two minutes, do two minutes. I think it, it is the um, regularity of it, of the process that actually, it's like strength training. You know, Then we are in some crazy situation at work and we realize, oh, I can let go more easily. I can start again more fully. I can listen better. I can forgive myself for not being perfect, whatever it might be. Um, that's where we see it. So uh, we're gonna sit together for more like 20 minutes um, for this, this round. And of course you, you know, welcome to sit for like an hour in your life if that is what works for you. But we can, we can all realize that um, a regular incorporation of these tools is what's most important. And it's, it's what makes it all real, you know, rather than just highly theoretical. So when you sit, um, you can be comfortable. You don't have to think about a pretzel-like pose unless that's comfortable for you. You wanna have your back straight without being stiff or uptight. And we'll talk about that also a little later. You can sit with your eyes open or closed. Uh, my earliest teachers, it was all eyes closed. My later teachers, it was all eyes open. Um, if your eyes are open, they could be like a little bit open. You could find a spot to rest your gaze. Let it go. And if you start with your eyes closed and you get really incredibly sleepy, just open your eyes and continue on. 
I'm going to guide this as though it were the feeling of the breath that is the central object. If you have another practice, you feel more comfortable doing, that's fine. If you um, are not used to sitting that long, that's fine. You know, you'll, you'll feel it. But, um, and you can know in your life and someday if you only have one minute, do the one minute, that's fine too. And I'll guide you into it. So as you sit, we can start just by listening to sound, whether it's the sound of my voice or other sounds. It's a way of relaxing deep inside, allowing our experience to come and go. And unless you are responsible for responding to the sound in some way, you can just let the sounds wash through you. Of course, we like some sounds and we don't like others. But we don't have to chase after them to hold on or push away. Just let them come, let them go. And bring your attention to the feeling of your body sitting, whatever sensations you discover. See if you can feel the earth supporting you. See if you can feel space touching you. Usually we think about touching space. We think about lifting up a finger and poking it in the air, but space is already touching us. It's always touching us. Bring your attention to your hands and see if you can move from the more conceptual level, like go fingers, to the worlds of direct sensation, picking up pulsing, throbbing, pressure, whatever it might be. You don't have to name these things, but feel them.
And then bring your attention to the feeling of your breath on the same level of picking up sensations, wherever the breath is most obvious to you. And this is just the normal natural breath. You don't have to try to make it deeper or different. Where do you feel it most strongly? Maybe it's the nostrils or the chest or the abdomen. You can find that place. Bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath. without concern for what's already gone by, without leaning forward for even the very next breath, just this one. And if you like, you can use a quiet, Mental notation like in, out, to help support the awareness of the breath, but very quiet. So your attention is really going to feeling the breath, one breath at a time. something arises and it starts to pull your attention away, you can recognize it's not the breath. You don't have to judge it. You don't have to judge yourself. See if you can let go gently and simply return to the feeling of the breath. And for all those many times when you are perhaps just gone, lost in thought, spun out in a fantasy, or you fall asleep, truly don't worry about it. You can realize you've been distracted or you've been gone, see if you can let go and just begin again. That's really the most important movement in the whole process, no matter how many times you have to let go and start over. It's fine.
Remember that word rest. We rest our attention and just one breath. You don't have to worry about what's already gone by. You don't have to lean forward for even the very next breath. It's just this one. And it's happening anyway. All you need to do is feel it.
I've considered it kind of miraculous that no matter where my mind goes, I can let go and I can begin again. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So thank you for that. We're gonna take a 10 minute break now, during which time it seemed like three, it was 20 minutes. Exactly, I have my eye on that the clock of the computer. Um, uh, 
we're going to have time for questions when we come back. So some of you want to write some questions in the chat. We'll also experiment uh, with the raise hand function, which I cannot operate personally. <laughs> so it's up to Ava. But um, uh, if you don't want the full 10 minutes, then of course you're welcome to practice more. I think if you have a question or comment, you'd like to put in the chat. Okay, see you soon. So welcome back. I'm gonna start uh, with some of the questions that came up in the chat and then we'll see where we go from there. Uh, somebody asked again about the difference between insight meditation and, and mindfulness meditation. There's actually not a difference between those two, the distinction uh, many systems would draw would be between practices that are largely designed to emphasize concentration and those which are largely designed to emphasize insight. So the way you get to insight is through mindfulness. So that's not to say that if you do a concentration practice, there's no mindfulness at all. Or if you do a mindfulness practice, there's no concentration at all, but the practices are designed differently in order to emphasize one thing or another. So in a concentration practice, the clue is usually, what do you do when something comes up that is not your object of concentration, your chosen object? The mantra, the sound, the prayer, the breath, the loving kindness phrase, whatever it might be. And if the answer is you see if you can let go gently and come back to the original object, that is a practice that's largely designed to foster concentration, which is the gathering of the energy that is usually lost to us because we're just throwing it all away. <clears throat> Getting obsessed with ruminating about the past in a way that's not useful getting overwhelmed with anxiety about the future in a way that's not useful, or just kind of going off in judgment, something like that. So if you think it's just about gathering the return of that energy, it gives us a sense of stability. It gives us a sense of centeredness. It empowers us because that's an awful lot of energy that could be available to us that is not because we're throwing it away. And as it returns to us, it can become available to us. So if you think about a practice that is largely about concentration, you think about power, empowerment. You also think about healing because just like in the movement of my hands of like all this energy coming together and these experiences coming together, there's a kind of integration of our being, a sense of cohesion that is very healing. And so that's really the nature of a concentration practice. The nature of an insight practice is that we're developing insight. Um, you know, and we'll talk much more about this later, but sometimes the insight's very personal, like. I talk about um, often sitting and looking at my own fear. 
and how one does that in a mindful way we'll talk about. But one of the things I've seen in doing that is unlike the world's pronouncement that we're afraid of the unknown, I get really afraid when I think I do know and it's gonna be really bad. So it's all the stories I tell myself, like, you know, like I start, this is a totally made up one, but you know, what about, you know, like, you know, no one's driven my car in so long and it's just sitting up there. What if they bring it down to pick me up in, in New York and it breaks down on the way and then, you know, we're gonna be stranded and at least it's not snowing, but what if it's raining? You know, it could be really bad. I'm gonna be out in the rain, I'm gonna get pneumonia, it's like, right? Uh, that's like a huge loss of energy. Um, and the insight is very important for me because needless to say, my mind doesn't do that only when I'm sitting in meditation. That is how I get most afraid. And even in the midst of that kind of arc of anxiety, having had the insight, if I remind myself, you know what? You don't know then I feel space, right? Then I feel relief. So sometimes the insight's very personal. Sometimes it's more what we would call universal insights, seeing the changing nature of everything. You know, emotions, different things come up and they come up so strongly, they're so intense that we just fall into this kind of like, this is, this is how it's gonna be. This is permanent. This is who I really am. I am that angry person. That's all that I am. But the more we see moment to moment how much everything is changing, the more we can recognize it's not so. And all the extrapolations from that, you know, those times when we feel really bad, like I have nothing and I will forever. And that person over there, they have everything and they will forever. Well, the more insight into the fact that nothing is forever, the more we can kind of see those thoughts and laugh really, because it's a genuine insight. It's not, we're trying to convince ourselves of something or someone else's idea. We're trying to force on ourselves. The way we see the world shifts, the worldview shifts, our values shift because of what we've seen. We see impermanence, we see interconnection, that we're not so alone, even though we feel so alone sometimes. That when we really look at the nature of things, we live in an interconnected universe. It's not romantic, it's not sentimental, it's just the way it is. It's not always pleasant, think of a pandemic. It's not always pleasant to think about interconnection. It just is. So we see some universal truths as well. We get, that's the nature of insight meditation, right? Personal truths, not so much what we would recognize. Um, well, it's not designed for like what we would recognize as kind of personal psychological truths, like, uh, I have this tendency because when I was younger, this happened and therefore I need to work it out this way. But we understand feelings so much more. We understand our experience so much more. So another example would be looking at a strong emotion like anger and basically deconstructing it because it's never just one thing. It's moments perhaps of sadness and moments of fear and moments of frustration and very, very likely moments of, of helplessness. Because anger is often considered the kind of thing in the Buddhist psychology we pick up when we feel weak because we think it's gonna make us strong. And in fact, the energy is very strengthening, but there are also limitations to being lost in anger, not feeling anger, but being lost in it. We lose a lot of information, for example, if you think about the last time you were very, very angry at yourself and just bring it up for a moment here, it's not a time where we think, you know what? 
I said that really stupid thing in the meeting that morning, but I did five great things as well last same morning. Those five great things, and they're gone. It's just the nature of the tunnel vision of being lost in a state like that. So we see all that. We see how it functions. We see the strength of the energy. We see the limitation of the um, tunnel vision. We see the compound nature of all these feelings that they're intricate, they're complex. So the engine for developing insight is mindfulness. So that's why I said there's not really a distinction between mindfulness meditation and insight meditation. One example would be, one way of practicing mindfulness would be, you're sitting there, you're feeling your breath, you're minding your own business, and this wave of anger comes up rather than thinking now off the breath, seeing if you can let go, coming right back to the breath, you stay with the feeling of anger a little bit. What does it feel like in my body? What's, you could say the anger movie, you watch the sadness reveal itself and the fear. You also see the changing nature reveal itself. That's different than why am I angry and what am I gonna do about it, which may be a very important reflection, but it's not the same as using mindfulness in the meditative process, right? So it's like, what is this? What is this feeling? That's the nature of the inquiry. One of the ways, kind of the quick and dirty way to discern, which is being emphasized, and they're both being developed, concentration and mindfulness, but which is being emphasized is what do you do when you have a central object like the feeling of the breath and something else arises powerfully? You know, strong wave of emotion, not like a little bitty dwippy thing, you know, but it's there with a bang. What do you do? If you're gonna switch your attention to be fully with that emotion, that's an insight practice because you're setting the stage for seeing things like, say the changing nature of it. Whereas if the thing you're doing right off the bat is seeing if you can let go and come back to that central object, it's more like a concentration practice. And again, we do both, they're not totally separate, but you can tell which is being emphasized um, through your own experience. I think it's also important to understand there's a lot unspoken in that, you know, even in the concentration part, like, I don't think, I, well, the term self-compassion was never used. It's a modern Western psychological term, you know, um, through the work of Kristen Neff and, and Chris Germer, but the essence of it was absolutely there. Like, how do you let go and come back? to something like the feeling of the breath. The really strong temptation, you know, you're sitting, you're feeling a few breaths, you get lost in thought, and then you realize I've been lost in thought. What is so tempting is, I can't believe I'm thinking, no one else is thinking, they're all sitting here in bliss. They're all sitting here bathed in brilliant white light. I forget the color of the light. There's some light people get, Maybe it's blue light or it's golden light. Maybe it's white light. Anyway, I don't have any light. They have light. They're really, they're either enlightened or on the very, very verge of enlightenment. They're so good. I'm so bad. I'm a terrible meditator. I can't even believe I call myself a meditator. I'm just so bad. All I do is think. They're not thinking. I'm thinking. Or maybe they are thinking, but they're thinking beautiful thoughts. They're thinking spiritual thoughts. They're thinking thoughts of loving kindness for everyone. I'm the only one who's thinking these stupid thoughts, which are identical to the same stupid thoughts I thought last thing, right? So when we get lost in that, and remember, we're not talking about just the arising of something. We're talking about getting locked into it, right? When we get lost in something like that, first of all, it takes up a lot of time and it maybe adds a considerable length of time to the distraction. And we're so exhausted, we're so demoralized by the end of it, it's much harder to start over. 
So the ironic thing is that so many people think having some compassion for yourself is being lazy. Um, and it's not having standards of excellence or really trying, whereas actually, and research is starting to show this, I'm told, self-compassion is the best way to learn something new, to change a habit, to progress in something. You've got to give yourself a break and realize it's not just you. People's attention wanders. Our attention is trained. We're conditioned to wander. What we need to do is let go gently and with great kindness toward ourselves, start over. You may never hear that expressed, but it's the only way it actually works. So even if we don't know it in practicing all practices, but even just talking about concentration, we're also cultivating self-compassion. Otherwise we're just off and running all the time, you know, in judgment, because that's our habit. And so um, there's a lot going on in what seems like a very simple exercise of letting go and starting over. Somebody wants to know what um, Goenka said or did when I admonished him for blame for making me so angry. And he just laughed. He thought it was like really funny. And I guess it was really funny. Which I, I think I sort of knew it was really funny anyway. Um, Uh, but that's that's what he did. He laughed. I mean, the the lessons are the same, you know. And, and you point that out, uh, Carol. The question, the the advice he gave would apply to anger, grief, remorse, etc. Um, and that's very true. There there are certain feelings that we tend to disdain. We're just taught that. We don't like them. We don't think we should have them. Um, and we call them bad in our minds rather than realizing they are painful. And these feelings are inevitable. Remember, we're not, we're not gonna get anywhere by struggling with what we feel. The question is how are we relating to that feeling? And the two extremes are getting completely socked into it so we have no perspective anymore. And the other extreme is being ashamed of it, trying to push it away, trying to deny it. And we say mindfulness is the place in the middle where we're neither completely consumed by what comes up, nor are we pushing against it. And that's a training. It's a skills training. And you know, you've got to give it some time and really be patient and just start over and over and over again, but it actually makes a big difference. And, and we'll talk more, more about that. But with those particular kinds of feelings, I would start right away with asking myself, am I calling it bad or can I recognize it as a state of suffering when I'm lost in it? And that will reveal a lot right there. What's my daily practice? I'm often struggling with trying to practice a lot each day. Yes, I mean, there are, there are, you know, there's so many ways of looking at practice and dividing it up. Um, one way of dividing it up is there's a formal dedicated period of practice. You could be lying down, you could be sitting, you could be walking, you know, and we'll do some walking a little later. Uh, you could, Let's say that last, that's the 12 minutes a day to give a Mishi her due. Um, that's the 12 minutes. It's a period of dedication. Let's say you're sitting and well, it doesn't have to be sitting. You're sitting down to deepen qualities like awareness and compassion. You're not also thinking about the strategic plan for your company. Like that may come up, but it's not your intention sitting down like, well, I'm sitting here, I'll figure that out too, you know. 
what comes up comes up, but our intention is to deepen awareness and kindness and so on. So that's the formal period. For me, as I said, it's just much more helpful to think about every day than three to five times a week, but that may not be true for everybody. But it's some regular period of dedicated practice. The other part of practice is what um, is sometimes called short moments many times. And that is remembering to take a breath now and then. Uh, pause before an activity. Nothing that takes very long, but will actually interrupt the kind of uh, tumbling forward into the pressure coming at you or speeding up when you really need to just slow down for a moment. The most famous example probably comes from Thich Nhat Hanh, who said, um, don't pick up your phone on the first ring, let it ring three times and breathe, then you pick it up. So I once gave that recommendation, I was teaching in, a, um, in, in person in a financial firm in New York, and I said that and I looked up and I saw the complete panic on everyone's faces. And I said, maybe for you just twice, just let it ring twice. So two or three times. The idea is just to pause and then you respond. So during the pandemic, you know, when I was really isolated, um, I took someone else's advice. It was, it was like a student of mine who said, um, I don't press send on the email right away. Uh, I write it and I take a few breaths, I read it again. And I decide if I'm saying things really in the way, because it's such an odd medium, you know, like it can be so easily misunderstood and, and you know, so uh, they said I read it again. And then sometimes I edit it and I actually took that upon myself as a habit. Uh, which was very interesting how many times I looked at what I'd just written and thought, ooh, that could be misinterpreted or that might go down the wrong way or, you know, and I'd write it again. Or, and or we do an activity like nothing again that's going to completely destroy your to-do list. But like you're drinking a cup of tea, you feel the warmth of the tea, you feel the weight of the cup, you smell the tea, you taste the tea. Like for once, don't multitask, like drinking the cup of tea while you're checking your email, while you're on a conference call, while you're, you've got the TV on and the news and you're, it's on mute and you're reading the crawl at the bottom of the screen. It will be a much, much, much more fulfilling cup of tea for one thing. Because we're actually experiencing it. And if, if we can just sprinkle these moments, I once I call them um, stealth meditations. Because again, I like that, you know, like you could be in a room full of people or a Zoom full of people. No one needs to know you're doing that. And it makes a big difference. You know, we start on some arc of anxiety, we come back where everyone else around us is like pressing us in some way, we come back to what we really care about, just like, just take a breath. Um, you know, so we can do a lot of that and it's actually very enriching, it's very fulfilling because the world like comes alive, our experience comes alive. Things that we just rush through or we do, you know, uh, really distanced from become alive. So there's that, you know, I don't think you have to worry about having like seven hours of meditation a day. If your life doesn't lend itself to that formal meditation, doesn't lend itself to that, or you um, are more moved. There's even research about people who only do those kind of activities and don't do that, say 12 minutes a day. Um, my name is even on one of those studies because I helped design it. Not that I understand it uh, as a study, but um, in truth for me, again, you know, self-knowledge is a good thing. 
I don't think I would really um, actually put a lot of those short moments into practice if I don't also do the 12 or 15 or 20 minutes a day because it starts becoming highly theoretical. It's like a story. Like, oh yeah, you can meditate doing anything. Nice, you know, but am I going to? You know, am I really gonna like let my phone ring twice? And I'm like, eh, you know? But I find if I put in the more dedicated time, the other becomes more natural and fun. So again, you know, I'd, I'd employ some self-knowledge. Um, my daily practice is these days, for a long time, you know, I, I did um, a loving kindness practice for about four years, only a loving kindness practice, which is its own method. Um, maybe we'll do some this afternoon. Uh, and then for years and years, uh, my daily practice, I do sit every day, uh, became like just a mindfulness practice, either with the breath or more open awareness, you know, which we'll do soon. And um, I would do loving kindness practice. The way I phrased it was any time I was waiting and I counted every mode of transportation as waiting, walking down the streets of New York, taxis, airplanes. Um, and that's how I did my loving kindness practice. But and then I stopped traveling. So uh, I brought it back more as a formal practice into my daily practice um, as well. And it, it's up to you really, you know, uh, what you're moved to do, what you can get guidance in if you want guidance and, and so on. I don't think it helps if practice feels like a struggle. You know, it doesn't always feel good, that's different. But if it feels obligatory and, and you, you know, you probably get more out of just lying, lying down and feeling the resistance and looking at the resistance and paying attention to that than forcing yourself to do it. What to do in meditation if there are thoughts or emotions that are hard to let go of? They're often hard to let go of. Um, and if you have uh, some confidence and experience in doing mindfulness practice, then you switch, you know, you don't want to struggle and force your mind back to the breath. But um, there, there are skills involved in being able to be with thoughts and emotions. And so you want to have some confidence in those skills because you've practiced it. Uh, mental noting is one. Um, you may not decide in the end that you really like it or it's worth doing, but it's an experiment. And it, I certainly found it worth doing, although very difficult for me. With mental noting, you know, you place a quiet mental note, like in, out, in, out with the breath. And then if something comes up very strongly, like a strong emotion, and the word comes easily, you place a label on it, like anger, anger, joy, Joy. And one of the ways it's useful is that it's an instant feedback system. It's like if you hear the tone of voice in your mind, there's something like anger, that's a clue, you know, that you're not exactly okay with it being there, right? And sometimes you just say it again, like, oh, anger. Now, the key to that and my struggle was if the word comes easily. Because I used to sit and meditate and think, is this pain or is this discomfort? Is there something in between pain or discomfort? And it was a total waste of time. And my sitting resembled somebody sitting down and reading a thesaurus. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be that, that exact. But it's an experiment, you know, and I got over that awkwardness and I find it very, very useful. Now, but that's one option for a skill. Feeling, if it's an emotion, feeling it in your body, if you can. We don't always, but often we do. And so 
it's a way of looking directly at the feeling rather than I knew I should have switched therapists a long time ago. Why didn't I do that? I need a new address. You know, then I wouldn't have anger anymore. It was like, she's like, okay, what is this? What am I feeling? Uh, so we use the physical sensations a lot. Um, an ability to pay attention and feel that place in the middle, you know, like, um, as many of you have heard me say, my favorite definition of mindfulness for a long time has been something I read in um, the New York Times many years ago. It was an early, early article about a pilot program bringing mindfulness into the classroom. So this was Oakland, California. Um, it was one of the very early programs bringing mindfulness into the classroom. And so it was a fourth grade classroom. So the kids were like nine or 10. So the journalist asked one of the kids, what is mindfulness? What is mindfulness? And he responded by saying mindfulness means not hitting someone in the mouth. That's what mindfulness means. And I thought, that is a great definition of mindfulness. Because what does it imply? It implies, first of all, knowing you're feeling angry when you're starting to feel angry. Not after you've sent the email, right? But as it's just bubbling up. It also implies a certain balanced relationship to the anger. And we're gonna talk more about balance later. Because what are the extremes? We fall into the anger, we're consumed by it, we're overwhelmed by it. And if that's what happens, we're likely to hit a lot of people in the mouth because life can be really frustrating. The other side of it is we can't stand what we're feeling. We're ashamed of it, we wanna push it away. We want to deny it and we get tighter and tighter and tighter till we explode. So mindfulness is the place in the middle where we can fully acknowledge what's happening without hurtling into it, without pushing it away. You can call it acknowledgement, like, oh, this is what's happening right now. And that opens the door to insight because, well, it's like common sense, right? If you have an emotion, that comes up and the instant you realize you're feeling it, you're trying to push it away. There's not gonna be a lot of learning going on. Like what are the constituent elements of this? At the same time, if you're in it and it's overwhelming and it's taking over everything, there's not gonna be a lot of learning going on because we're too consumed by it. So there's some space that happens, some spaciousness. And in that spaciousness, creativity can arise, different options for action may arise. Like I like to think of that kid thinking, hit someone in the mouth last week, didn't work out that well. Maybe I'll try this. And in fact, I have a story, I put it in two books now, so I have to stop, but for my friends who have an organization um, called the Holistic Life Foundation, uh, bringing tools of yoga and meditation into the inner city schools of Baltimore. And they told me this great story about a little girl. She was younger than fourth grade. I think she was maybe like seven. And uh, kids would tease her a lot and they kind of bullied her, but she, she would like knock them out cold. So she was always in trouble and they taught her meditation. And one day they said they, they went into some public space like the cafeteria or the gym or something. And she was holding up this other little girl by the throat against the wall. And then she looked at her and she said, you're just lucky I had to meditate. She dropped her. And she went off and sat in the corner. You know, so it's not like we, we want to get to a place where we never respond to anything. We do want to act. We want to respond, but maybe we don't want to be driven, you know, to the old familiar action, which wasn't serving us. We want options. We want 
room for creativity. So that's what happens when we practice mindfulness. So you can see, you know, maybe the thoughts or emotions are coming up. You see if you can let go. You can't open to them, you know, try mental noting, something like that. Um, the basic skill of being kind to yourself is going to be the same, the same kind of thing. Question around concentration and attention uh, with an attention disorder. I, you know, I think there, there, I don't know if there are specific trainings because something like ADHD or ADD would be considered, I think, from the Buddhist psychological framework is just a gradation, you know, of restlessness, agitating problems we all have. Um, and I would look, uh, I'm sure, I know that people have done research. I would see if you can come upon um, either sites like the Minds and Life Institute, uh, or uh, possibly Richie Davidson's um, Center for My Healthy Mind in Wisconsin. There are different people who are very interested in researching um, meditation practices, have websites that try to offer some knowledge to the general public. Um, and, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is Mind and Life Institute. Because it's it's really interesting, isn't it? You know, the and actually you might look at Amishi's book, Amishi Ja, J H A, because it's all about attention. That's her thing, is attention. And she works um with people who are uh in high, high stress high performance activities. So I think I think there would be a lot there actually for you. Practice Vipassana, which is insight meditation in the past. But for the last two years we've been practicing transcendental meditation. How can these practices, two practices work together? Um, I uh, have never done TM, you know, per se, but I've done mantra meditation. Um, and I have friends who, who do, do TM and insight meditation or mindfulness meditation. The one thing that they do that I've, I've uh, been told is sometimes they just separate it. You know, if, with TM, if you sit 20 minutes twice a day, they actually do TM once a day for 20 minutes and they do insight meditation once a day. I mean, I noticed with, um, by the time I was doing a mindfulness practice, which would be kind of maybe starting with the breath, but having a kind of more open awareness of the many things coming and going. And I had a loving kindness practice, which is much more like a mantra where you're repeating certain phrases. Um, it was important for me given my mind to, to be able to structure it in some way. So basically I would do things like that this week or this month or it. for the sitting, I'm gonna do loving kindness practice for the evening sitting, I'm gonna do mindfulness, whatever it is. And, and uh, it was important for me, not that you wanna feel imprisoned by that decision, but when I noticed by the time I had two techniques, I would sit and I would do something for a minute and a half. And I think it's not working. I'm going to switch to the other one. So I switched to the other one for maybe 30 seconds. I say, now nah, I'm going back. And then I'd go back and I think, oh, God, it's boring. I'm going to switch again. And then I was never doing anything because I was just jumping around. So I'm you know, I've seen so many times as I describe myself, I'm the kind of person who's really served by structure. Um, and I sort of saw that, you know, like when I was living in India, I wasn't always on retreats. I was just living in India. And 
it was very hard for me to have a daily practice. Like when things felt good, I think, oh, great. I'm going to live in India for the entire rest of my life feeling it's wonderful. And when things in my practice felt bad, I was restless, I was bored. My knees hurt, my back hurt. I'd get up, I think it doesn't work. Or I can't do it. And I went to one of my teachers, this man named Manindra, who said to me, for you, I have just one piece of advice. And that is just put your body there. Every day, just put your body there. Some days it's gonna feel one way, other days it's gonna feel another way. It's kind of a mystery anyway, because things are happening below the surface, you know, and we may not see them. So uh, it's another structure is another helpful tool for excessive self judgment. But again, that's not true for everybody. So you can kind of learn for yourself what really helps me have a practice. Okay, so I didn't sleep well yesterday, so I was struggling to not sleep today. So it's opening your eyes. Any other advice? Yes, I mean, there's a whole long list of advice, which we can go into much more when we come back. Um, there's a list supposedly from the Buddha, which is really cute. It does include things like open your eyes, maybe stand up, do walking meditation if you know how to do it. Um, uh, have a more elaborate technique. If you know loving kindness, that would work. Or just what I talked about earlier, notice what you're seeing, notice what you're hearing, flesh on your whole posture. Because if you're just with the breath, it's going to get to be like a lullaby. Uh, if you are with the breath, use mental noting. Like don't just feel the breath. Say internally in, out, or rising, falling. That extra word will pick up your energy. What's your aim? Like, it's just this one breath. If you try to be with this breath and get ready for the next 50, it's like spreading the energy too far. Whereas if you say just this one breath, it'll pick up your energy. So there's this really cute list, which includes some of that and includes pulling on your earlobes, which I never, ever remember to do. And I can't say why it's on the list, but if there are any acupuncturists amongst us, I'm sure you can. And then the last thing on the list is take a nap, which I always thought was so cute. Like it's on the list, but it's not the first thing on the list. Sometimes we're just tired. We need a nap, you know, so go for it. Okay, we have an hour now of a break. I would really urge you um, do something mindfully, whatever it is, you know, go outside for a walk or drink a cup of tea or maybe you're having a meal or uh, even if it's just like a little part of this time, just to sort of start bringing the practice out. And that just means observe what's most predominant in your experience. You're holding the cup or you're smelling the tea, whatever's strongest, just to be aware of it. Okay, Ava, do you have announcements for us? Um, well, we don't have any particular announcements. Uh, okay, uh, so if you if you get out, obviously you need the link to get back in. Are are you closing down or can? No, I will keep the Zoom room open. So if you don't have to close up your computer, it may be best that you just stay on. Uh, if you uh, have to close down the computer, just use the same Zoom link that you used to uh, get on Zoom this morning. Thank you. Okay, see you in an hour. Hello. Um, I want to have us do a kind of 
mini retreat, sit, sit, walk, sit, but uh, in case you've just eaten like two minutes ago, why don't we spend a few minutes to see if there's some more questions, anything you want to put in the chat or maybe you want to raise your hands and then we'll, uh, we'll do another sitting using a more expansive mindfulness technique. I'll discuss walking meditation, which would be one option for <clears throat> the middle part. The other option would be like drinking a cup of tea or some action uh, that will bring mindfulness into interactivity and then another sitting. Okay, so do you have any questions? Uh, do you, Heidi, do you want to raise your hand to ask your question or you want to put it in the chat? Uh, yeah, Heidi, she'll have to, I think she, the instructions just went up for how to be called on to be unmuted. Ava, you're, you're also muted. <laughs> I'm sorry, Heidi. Uh, there are many pages here today and I'm having a trouble finding you. So if you could use the raise hand function, uh, your square will be come up to the top and so that I'm able to unmute you easier that way. Or um, let me see. And I put the instruction on how to find the raise hand function in the chat box. If you are on a, a desktop computer, it will be on the bottom of the screen. Uh, it says reactions and it's, uh, it, it looks like a smiley face icon and if you click on it there will be a raise hand function there oh there you are hello hello thank you very much for this afternoon i really appreciate eight the opportunity to be with you i um my question has to do with suffering um, I, I am also in the MMTCP program. Um, we're well into our second year now, and this is at the year of our practicum. I, um, I, a number of months ago, lost my dog of 13 years, and then I lost my mom, and I was her um, medical advocate. Um, being in the medical field as a dietitian, um, it, that was a huge part of my role in the end of her life. When I say that, it was like two years. And most recently, um, my 20 year old son um, has relapsed with um, drug addiction. And I, um, and it's a serious drug. It's drugs that could take his life on any given day. So I've had a lot of suffering and I am very aware of this mm -hmm. and my practice has served me so, so well. And my, um, my mentor group and my peer group and my sanghas have been so good. Um, and I have done a lot of work. I work with a therapist as well. So I'm very aware um, my question is, um, does it help to, I, it's hard to, it's just, I've had so much that I'm weary and I'm exhausted from feeling quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And um, 
does it help to say the word suffering? Like I'm suffering, suffering, like instead of trying to say this is anger or this is grief or this mm -hmm. is this. And I know you can't tell me when it will go away, but um, can I expect some relief at some point? Um, I think it's getting better, but I have to deal with it daily. I guess that's my question. The peace of my son literally is, is a daily thing. Mm -hmm. It's not, and like, if this is my level of concern and this is like zero concern, and this is the highest concern, my concern for him is, is always like right here. And then something will happen and it brings it here. So I'm, I'm, I'm even in here. I'm, I'm never really getting to come down. Does, does that make sense? My question? Yeah, yeah no, it does make sense. And, and you know, I have a lot of I have responses on different levels, you know, um, one is, um, for, of course, I'm sorry you've had a, and are having a really tough time. And I think that's sometimes hard to acknowledge. You know, somebody once came to me uh, sort of down herself, like I should be better. I should have more equanimity. I should have more peace of mind. And I asked her, I said, can you um, make me a list of everything you've been through in the last year? And she chose instead to draw it. So she made me a drawing. But then we looked at it together and I said, you know, like your cat died, your house burnt down, you got estranged from your brother. Let's look at this. You have been through a tough time, you know, and sometimes just simply acknowledging that is very important. Uh, in terms of the suffering and the pain, I do think it would be helpful just to say this is suffering. It reminded me a little bit of um this experience I had with this Burmese meditation teacher, Saida Upandita, who um, we invited to teach at IMS in 1984, never having met him before. Mm -hmm. And we heard he was a really great teacher, so we brought him and he was a great teacher. And he also proved to be like incredibly tough and demanding and fierce, fierce kind of teacher. So I'll, I'll tell you something about that in a minute. But we were meeting him six days a week um, for these very brief meetings just to describe our practice and get some feedback. Um, uh, I went through a period of a lot of pain and sorrow in my practice, as one sometimes does. So six times a week, I was saying to him, you know, how much things hurt. And then I look at him, I realize now, with his face full of expectation, like, tell me what to do to make it go away. <laughs> and yeah. all he would say to me was, well, that's dukkha, isn't it? Dukkha being the Pali word for suffering. He'd say, that's dukkha, isn't it? And it's all he would say. Mm -hmm. And I'd leave and I'd come in the next day and all he would say is, it's dukkha, isn't it? And I, I was thinking, we brought you all the way from Burma. Like, <laughs> why don't you teach me something? You know, All you ever say is, well, that's dukkha, isn't it? But of course he was, it was an important thing for me because whatever we choose to do and we do take action sometimes it needs to be from a base of that kind of acceptance yes this is really hard i'm in pain this really hurts um sometimes we inadvertently add to that you know through whatever habit of mind it doesn't sound like you are, like you're not isolated, you have groups, you have people, you have a community, but sometimes we have a sense of isolation. You know, I'm the only one, or um, I should be better, you know? It's like a sense of shame or whatever it is. And, and so those are the things we look at first. Can I relinquish the hold of some of those, those habits? There's also a place where, um, I learned this from Upandita, ironically enough, tough as he was, uh, somebody asked him in the meditation hall, how long should I pay attention to physical pain before I move my attention to something that's easier to be with? Like in sitting, that might mean listening to sound, it might mean loving kindness, something like that. And it was a very profound question because we use physical pain as a model for emotional pain 
for heartache, for disappointment? How long should I just be with it before I go to something easier? Like make a respite, make some relief yes. and then go back. And I thought given his personality, he was going to say, you should be with it till you fall over. I really did. And to my amazement, he said, don't be with it for very long. He said, be with the pain, move your attention to something that's easier. Go back to the pain. If it's still there, go back to something that's easier. He said, it's not wrong to be with the pain and be with the pain and be with the pain, but you'll likely get exhausted. Yeah. And he said, why not build in balance all along the way? And I was sitting there thinking, he must really feel that's the truth because he was like the furthest thing in the universe from somebody who would say something just to be nice, yeah. you know? Uh, and I took a lot from that, you know, like um, sometimes it's very important to be with the pain. We have not been allowed that in our life maybe. And, and that's the most significant thing. But a lot of times we need to move in and out because it's too exhausting. Right. And that's very hard for people. You know, people, we feel stupid, you know, like uh, we're being conflict avoidant or we're being indulgent. What do you mean taking the joy? You look at this terrible thing that is happening in my family or in the world or, you know, but we kind of have to do it. Otherwise we get exhausted. Yeah. And that was something I learned, you know, in my own practice and my own life, you know, very much so because it was very, very important for me to feel that pain of my childhood, which all came later. I mean, the feeling of it came later, but at the same time, we need balance because the point isn't to crumble with the pain, but to carry on, you know? Yes. So I don't know what would, what would give you balance. You're certainly not alone, you know, in any of those extremely tough situations and, and especially with your son you know to to have the supportive community and and don't hesitate to take in the joy the little little things you know looking at the sky or you know I have a plant that's alive in my apartment which is like <laughs> unknown it's the first time in my whole life I've kept a plant alive <laughs> so yes. I just looked over at it and I thought wow you know it's still there <laughs> like yes. Um, and because those things, you know, they help us keep going and, and it's what we need. So I would say both, I'd say yes to all of it, you know, acknowledge yeah. the suffering is suffering, give yourself a break, remind yourself you're not alone and, uh, be willing to take in the joy. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the joy piece like that that speaks to me. And we decided a couple months ago to get a puppy and the puppy won't arrive just yet, but we've got about six weeks to wait. And this breeder sends us pictures and video of the, of the puppies. And I'm, I'm, I'm enthralled with this because it's, I'm looking at this one day and I'm, I'm, I, I keep pushing the, the replay on the video and all of a sudden I just stop and I'm, I had this feeling come over me and I was, I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is joy. Like, this is joy. Like I haven't felt this feeling in so long. And I just kept pushing the puppy video. Yeah. So I think I, what I'm trying to say is I hear what you're saying about, mm. I must call, I must create this moments of joy, these things that bring me joy. And um, I, I am going to use the word suffering because I think that that, if that helps me to at least just yeah. say it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I need to create those moments of joy. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I have, yeah. a, you know, when we do loving kindness practice, one of the categories um, we offer of beings, we offer loving kindness to as a benefactor someone who's helped us or uh, the text says someone whom when we think of them, we smile. So I actually use a friend's puppy yes. because the puppies made such a huge difference. It's like a pandemic adoption, you know, uh -huh. made such a huge difference for the family. So the puppy is like the benefactor that I call to mind. And <laughs> I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Molly, where's Ava? Oh, hi, thank you. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity um, for me to ask the question. I am um, actually, I just have, um, have a question about using Brahma Viharas as a protection. So basically my, my, my um, situation is also that I ha I've had a lot of suffering <laughs> and um, I, uh, you know, grew up in a you know, abusive and traumatic childhood. And then as an adult, I had a lot of mental health struggles <clears throat> like depression, anxiety, addiction, and just all kind of trauma and problems. So, so a year ago, I decided to um, take time off and just started meditating full time because I find it to be very, very healing. So what happened is that I just, I mean, I, a lot happened. I've been learning a lot, but then in this process, I just become more and more sensitive. <laughs> I, I'm like wide open, like my energy is like porous, like everything just get to me. And like little things, uh, um, small things that usually didn't even bother me in the past, now starts to bother me because <laughs> I'm like feeling it all. <clears throat> and I see a person and I feel their feelings and negativity. I'm like, oh, that really hurts. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, like, it's really uh, intense mm -hmm. and I'm trying to regulate this. And I'm like, how, how do I, you know, make this more balanced? So I'm trying to do a, more of Brahma Viharas and uh, Metta and compassion and just a lot of that. And I'm trying to find a way. I mean, I read a lot about, you know, how you can use Metta as protection, how you can, you know, ground you, provide a sense of safety. And I'm starting to feel some of it but not quite. So I'm like curious about mm -hmm. how exactly uh, do, do, can, can I get to that? Like, mm -hmm. better. yeah, that's all. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, they, they do say that um, the Buddha first taught loving kindness is the antidote to fear. So that's part of the way it, it serves as a protection is that and, and it, we can kind of understand that just energetically, it's the opposite. You know, when we're afraid of a situation or a person, it's like we, you know, we shrink back. Whereas with loving kindness, we're kind of interested in them. And, you know, uh, loving kindness, I should also say, and, and this is partly in response to a question to me in the chat, loving kindness doesn't dictate a certain kind of behavior. Like you must spend time with this person even though you don't think it's safe or, you know, it's not demanding action in that way. It's a heart space. So whatever action we take doesn't need to be so based on fear. It can be based more in a sense of connection, but I'll, I'll respond more directly to that in a little while. Um, but the key, I think, to what you're asking about fundamentally is not so much loving kindness, but equanimity, which is the fourth Brahma Vihara, and it means balance, and, and we're always looking at balance, you know, like if you've spent all this time meditating, which is wonderful, maybe it's time to balance that out, you know, do some service or uh, help someone else out, which is its own kind of joy. Not all day, you know, necessarily, but, but something, you know, so that there are kind of larger balances to look at, but Equanimity itself means balance and in a dynamic, um, it would mean having boundaries. You know, so as you talk about the energy entering you, the sensitivity is good, but you don't want the energy entering you because then how do you get rid of it? You know, how do you make it move? So we want to balance this, not get rid of the sensitivity, but balance it with kind of centeredness. and and good boundaries, you know? So that might be um, in a situation, I mean, some of it, again, 
will depend on what you notice in your own introspection, but sometimes that energy enters us because we have a kind of underlying belief that we're responsible for making other people happy, for fixing it all, you know? And that makes sense to me because if you saw somebody in a classroom or an office uh, being really toxic, but you didn't have that kind of thing, that pattern, you might feel a lot of compassion for them, but you wouldn't feel like they filled you, you know? Something is happening within that allows that energy to really land inside. So commonly it is some feeling of over-responsibility or I've got to make everything better or, something, but you can look and just see what it, it might be for you. Uh, the equanimity practices that we do have to do with creating space. First of all, mindfulness is an equanimity practice. So the more you practice mindfulness, the more that will develop. But there are actual phrases, like when you do loving kindness practice, you know, there are phrases like maybe happy, maybe safe, maybe peaceful. And the equanimity phrases are more like, um, I care about your situation and I'm, I can't control it. It's like, it's like when uh, you want to help a friend and you do everything you can and you're present, you say what you can. And it's so frustrating because you can't like reach inside their brain and make the decision for them about where they're going to live, you know? And you know, if you could only do that, they would be a lot happier. And that's true, but you can't do that because the world's not like that. You know, so we need boundaries. We need clarity. Like, oh, I'll do everything I can. And I'm not in charge. Thank you. I, I'm just actually a quick follow up about the boundary. My understanding of boundary is almost like a thought based, you know, here's a boundary. I think there's an idea. Here's a boundary. Is it like actually can be a kind of a boundary that is the emotional boundary or some sort of energetic? Yeah. Boundary? Yeah. I mean, if you if you explored things, my understanding is if you explored things like um, different kind of trauma therapy, since you you brought up trauma, you know, a lot of it is around that, like energetic boundaries, because uh, you know, back to trauma for a moment. Somebody I can't remember who define trauma as a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. You know, and some childhoods are really abnormal. Some situations are really abnormal. So the reactions, the extreme sensitivity, all of that, that's normal. That makes sense, you know. But you don't want it to be your only response to the world. At least you want a variety, you know, of different options. And so um, we don't want to be stuck in those as the only response we have. And so we look for ways of balance. And so a lot of trauma therapy, I wish I could remember somebody once, um, I was in uh, a workshop, it was one of the teachers, but someone else was, it was, you know, their time. And they were trying to describe like, have drawing like an energetic boundary, which you do, they were talking about it physically like just like what I'm doing with my hands, but not obviously, so the person wouldn't know. And, and they did it so well, like sweeping back their hair or something like that, you know? I wish I could remember what they did because it was brilliant, you know? So, wow, look at that. You know, so there are, and you have to experiment because I don't really know these well, but, you know, there are ways of doing it energetically. There are ways of doing it emotionally. I know it through the meditative way, which will do it emotionally and energetically, but it may not be, the fastest, you know, but that's what, the, if you look at my book, my first book, Loving Kindness, um, it has a whole chapter on equanimity with a variety of phrases and things like that. And, you know, it's one of those qualities people think it means being indifferent or being cold. And it doesn't mean that, it just means bringing wisdom into the equation because in the end, it's what's true. Like I said to this group once in front of this group, if I were in charge of the universe, it would be so much better a world. And someone in the group challenged me. They said, are you sure? And I said, I am really sure. 
and not a day goes by that I'm not more sure, you know. We, you missed the pro big protest went by my window the other, the other minute, you know. Um, but it's not, it's not that way. It's not gonna be that way. And that understanding doesn't undermine compassion. It actually strengthens compassion because we don't get so frustrated and feeling it's all our fault or that we failed or it didn't happen fast enough. Or, and this, of course, you know, when you have someone you love who's really suffering, it figures very strongly that we need some equanimity in order to be able to hang in there. So that's, that would be the kind of the classical answer is like what builds in balance for you because the sensitivity is good, but you don't want to go to just one side of things, you know, you want the other side as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Because we're going to sit and then I'm going to go on to some loving kindness and some consideration of those real life situations. <laughs> Okay, so equanimity is like the secret ingredient in mindfulness too, because mindfulness means not just knowing something is going on, like I'm hearing a sound or I'm feeling an emotion, but it's knowing with some balance, right? Like go back to when I talked about mental noting, you don't have to use mental noting, but it would make it obvious. Like if, you're, if you hear yourself something thinking, that's a clue, right? You're really not happy about that thought being there. And that's different than, oh, thinking. So there's something about the quality of mindfulness that recognizes what's going on, doesn't freak out about it, doesn't judge it, isn't adding all the stuff we usually add, like this is the only thing I'll ever feel, or I'm the only one, or it's just like this recognition, this is what's happening right now. And that opens the door for exploration and wisdom. So we need the equanimity. And I, I don't know about now, because I haven't really looked at a lot of recent mindfulness studies, very early mindfulness studies, left that out almost completely. It was all about, do I know I'm angry when I'm angry? Can I say I'm sad when I'm sad? You know, and that's a hugely important step, but it wouldn't exactly match what mindfulness means because what if you recognize you're sad and you're so deeply ashamed of that? It's not really mindfulness. It's better than not knowing you're sad for sure, you know? Absolutely, but that balance is an intrinsic part of mindfulness because that's what opens the door to insight. It's like, if you have an emotion that comes up and you are fighting it from the moment you see it, there's not gonna be a lot of learning going on because you're just in the fight, right? And so uh, equanimity is, is like part of the secret of mindfulness that we say mindfulness doesn't take the shape of what it's watching. You can be mindful of joy, you can be mindful of sorrow. You can be mindful of the state you don't wanna admit to ever feeling to anybody else. And you can be mindful of the thing you wanna boast about more than anything. You can be aware of physical pain, physical joy. You know, mindfulness can go anywhere because it's not about what's happening. It's about how we are with what's happening. You know, how present are we? How balanced are we? How interested are we? Um, and, and that's it. And that's encapsulated for some people and some techniques by mental noting. But again, you don't have to be actually mentally noting. It's a spirit. Sometimes you've probably heard of, because it's so popular, especially uh, teachers like Tara Brock really emphasizes this acronym called RAIN, R-A-I-N, which symbolizes a mindful relationship to something. So let's say it's a strong emotion that has come up in your sitting. 
strong enough to take your attention away from the breath. So it now becomes the predominant thing going on. And what Tara is suggesting or some other teachers is this R-A-I-N, first recognize what's going on. Oh, there's anger. Acknowledge it or accept it. You know, don't run right into, maybe if I had three therapists instead of two, you know, I wouldn't be angry anymore or whatever. You know, just like, okay, this is what's happening. I uh, investigate it in the sense I was talking about before, like what's it made of? If you just hang in there with the feeling, looking directly at the feeling and it's anger, you will see fear, you will see sadness, you will see uh, helplessness, you will see change because you're looking at, at what is. And then N, um, this is a made up system, remember, N used to mean non-identifying, like instead of saying, I'm such an angry person and I always will be. Just recognize it as a passing state. These days, especially Tara uh, talks about the end as nurturing. Like, be nice to yourself anyway. You know, be kind to yourself anyway. But, and that may be, you know, you don't have to go through that whole lengthy process. It's like a certain attitude we have and we develop, we cultivate toward what arises strongly so that. We're not saying this is a terrible mistake or I'm the worst meditator that ever lived or how am I gonna get rid of this forever? But like, what is this? What's happening right now? And that's where all the learning takes place. That's where the transformation takes place. Um, so one way we practice is uh, in sitting, we have, it's not the only way to practice, but it's a common way to practice that we have a central object, like the feeling of the breath. And then when something comes up that is strong enough to take us away from the breath, that becomes the new object of meditation, at least for a few moments. So if you were noting, it would be something like in, out, in, out, anger, anger anger in, out. And again, you don't have to use the note, but that it's just an easy way of describing it. We spend a few moments with what comes up strongly. If it's an emotion, see if you can feel it in your body. Sort of recognize it for what it is. See if you can let go, come back to the feeling of the breath. And if you just get lost, there's too much going on, you're just, you're just spinning, that's the moment to remember we can let go and start over. We can always just come back to that central object and, and it's fine to do that. Okay, so unless you have any questions about that way of practice, we'll spend another 20 minutes sitting together, is that okay? Okay, and if you feel like stretching or just, you know, getting up first, it's fine. Something like the feeling of the breath can serve as that central object, as the home base. The ultimate goal is not to only be with the breath, but it's a way of coming home and recalibrating, like, oh, this is what it feels like to just be with an experience. You can start again, if you like, by listening to sound, you can sit comfortably. We want some energy in our body, so that usually means the back straight, but not so much energy that we're really stiff and uptight. We also just wanna be relaxed and at ease. You can start by listening to sound if you want. It is a way of relaxing deep inside and allowing our experience to come and go. And throughout the course of the sitting, if you feel uptight, you can always go back to listening to sound. If you feel tense, if you feel stressed. and bring your attention 
into your body, feel yourself sitting. And bring your attention to the feeling of your breath, the actual sensations of the in and out breath. Just the normal natural breath, but wherever you feel it most distinctly. Nostrils, chest, or abdomen. Find that place, bring your attention there and just rest. See if you can feel one breath. images or sounds or sensations or emotions should arise. If they're not all that strong, if you can stay connected to the feeling of the breath, just let them flow on by. You're breathing, it's just one breath. But if something comes up and it is strong, it captures your attention. See if you can spend a few moments recognizing, oh, this is what's happening right now. There's joy, or there's sorrow, whatever it might be. And only then see if you can let go, come back to the feeling of the breath. And if you feel lost, you feel confused, there's too much going on, or your mind has just fled into fantasy, or you fall asleep, really don't worry about it. You can recognize that. See if you can let go, come back to the breath.
And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So to continue on with the retreat within a retreat concept, uh, we're gonna take 20 minutes. I'd like you to maybe do some walking meditation, which I'll describe in a minute or, and or some activity, make a cup of tea or go outside and walk around the block or you're all in such different circumstances. You know, it's hard to say what would be easiest to do. Like some of you clearly have pets, you know, maybe your dog wants to go out for a walk, probably not so much your cats. Um, or, or make that cup of tea. In walking meditation, uh, eyes open. You can walk at different speeds. If you're outside, uh, usually just we say look normal. If you're inside, you might want to slow down more and uh, just walk back and forth. Rather than keeping your attention on the feeling of the bat breath as the primary object, just the sensation of your feet your feet touching the ground or your leg going up and down or your body moving through space. It's some sensation. The idea is to rest your attention lightly when your attention wanders because it will, especially eyes open. Just recognize that and see if you can come back to just resting your attention on the sensation. That doesn't mean like try to squeeze your attention down and block out everything else because you'll barge into things. You know, you want to be aware of everything going on around you, but you just have this touch point. Like right now, as you're sitting, feel, eyes open, feel the most pronounced sensation in your body, wherever that is. And even as you listen and you're aware of everything around you, you just have a way of touching in with that, right? And that's basically the walking meditation. You can do it in different speeds. You can do it. So you, you're just feeling your, your feet touching, like touch, 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 touch. You can really slow down. So you're like slowly going up, moving forward, placing, shifting your weight, next foot. It's really up to you. What I just want is that experience of eyes open, bringing mindfulness into a daily activity. And if you're, drinking that cup of tea and you feel this tremendous impulse at the same time to check your email, maybe don't, you know, keep the easiest thing to be aware of is usually the body. And we want to do this in the easiest way possible. So that's why I keep saying like, feel the warmth of the teacup or the coolness at this point of the teacup. Um, and use your other senses as well, okay? So uh, we'll come back um, in uh, 20 minutes. So just before 5.20 uh, my time. And then we'll do one more sitting and then move on to loving kindness, okay? So welcome back. Why don't we do another sitting so that we have um, that experience of, of some continuity of, of formal practice. Whatever we're doing, whether it's formal or informal practice is always gonna be some amount of beginning again we have to do. You know, you're drinking that cup of tea and suddenly you're fantasizing about a vacation in another country. You realize it, you come back. Um, you're doing walking, you're doing sitting, whatever it might be. We're gone, <laughs> just a lot of the time. And we realize it, we see if we can let go and come back. 
So once again, I'd encourage you, actually really it's up to you whether you want to be focusing more on the idea of concentration in this sitting. If you feel like there's too much going on and you're kind of restless or agitated, you would be better served by just more quickly coming back to the breath or you feel uh, fit, your concentration is fairly stable and you're interested in what's going on or what's coming up is so intense that it's ridiculous to imagine you can let go and, and go back to the breath. And that happens too. So either way is fine, you know, um, in terms of an emphasis. The important thing is, is really some of the same principles, being able to begin again when we've got, totally lost it. Um, taking an interest in our experience, practicing non-judging, having some compassion for ourselves and so on. So let's sit together. Remember that what arises is not so important. What's really important is how we are with what arises. So you can't be failing. You can't be having the wrong experience. It's all fine. But how are we with it?
And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So thank you so much. So back to um, the earliest classification I did where I said there are some practices that emphasize concentration more than anything and other practices that emphasize insight more than anything, the vehicle for which is mindfulness, which is really what we were just doing. And I said, there are many possibilities for concentration practice. And I wanna say again, it's not like you never get an insight doing concentration practice or you never have any mindfulness, but the, it's almost like the design of the practice is to emphasize certain things. So more than anything, uh, doing a concentration practice, you will get the benefits of concentration, a kind of unification of your being, a sense of power, because all that energy is returning to you, um, focus. And depending on what the object is, that central object, you may get other benefits as well. So one concentration practice is loving kindness practice. That's the classification it falls under, where instead of settling on the feeling of the breath, we settle our attention on the silent repetition of certain phrases, like may you be safe, may you be happy, and so on. And I'll, of course, go much more into that. So not only do we get the benefit of the concentration, we get the benefit of the quality of loving kindness, because that's being cultivated at the same time. I found it you know, obviously a really powerful practice. It's a very tricky practice because I think we can have so much self-judgment around matters of the heart. I've had certainly a lot of people say to me, I have no heart. Um, we can also have a very, very narrow definition of what we think loving kindness should feel like. And I, assert over and over again, I don't think it needs to be emotional at all. Sometimes it's just paying attention differently. You know, those times if you're in conversation with somebody and maybe all you're thinking about is what someone else told you about them, they're so boring, they're so ineffective, whatever it is, and you're really not listening at all. And then you realize that and you let go of the filter and you actually arrive and you listen. That's like a gesture of loving kindness to be present, to be open-minded in that way. Or um, with ourselves, you know, many, many of us have the habit of only uh, or most strongly relating to things we've did wrong or like if you're evaluating yourself at the end of the day, say like, how'd I do today? And you pretty well only remember the mistakes you made and when you mispronounced that word and when you could have done better doing that, let's just say. The practice of loving kindness is an invitation to step out of that very narrow groove of how we're accustomed to paying attention and broaden it. Like what else happened today? Anything good? I liken the practice most strongly to a gratitude reflection where 
many researchers and psychologists will say one of the most healing things any of us can do is at the end of the day, write down three things we're grateful for from the day. Now, a lot of people don't like that. And I've heard that feedback. That's like being um, duped into settling for crumbs. You know, you're going to be grateful for this little thing, whereas you're being treated so unfairly or unjustly, and you're not going to fight because you're going to sit there thinking, I have a crumb. I'm so, you know, I'm so well off and uh, that it makes us self-satisfied and weak. And, and this too, one hears a lot about loving kindness practice, but actually in um, talking to researchers about gratitude practice, uh, especially this, this one scientist at the University of, um, at Northeastern University in Boston, David Justeno, he was saying that Actually, gratitude practice does the opposite because it gives us energy. Again, if you're awash in suffering and overwhelmed by it and broken by it, you're not going to get out of bed, you know? It's too hard. We need sources of energy and, and resilience so we can actually stand up and see if we can make a difference. And so... Uh, gratitude is one thing that does that. Plus, they, he said that um, if you have struggled yourself somewhere in life and someone has been good to you, for example, and you're grateful for that and you remember that, that reminds you that even a little thing can make a big difference in someone's life and you feel motivated to share that, to pay it forward, so to speak. So gratitude reflection isn't something that makes you just kind of lazy, you know, and, and uh, indifferent to the plight of the world. It actually gives you energy. So the way it reminds me of loving kindness practice is that it's often a stretch. Like I will say that my own conditioning, my personal conditioning, my familial conditioning, my cultural conditioning as such, that I'm so much more likely to get to the end of the day and remember what I have to complain about. You know, I didn't show up in the way that I wanted to and that person disappointed me. And back in the days when I was traveling, there was always an airline, you know, there's still always a phone service. Now there's Zoom, you know, <laughs> Zoom needed a password. It was really unbearable. Um, <coughs> you know, that's where my mind goes. So it takes intentionality, not force, not coercion, but real intentionality to say, what else happened today? You know, it doesn't have to be something grandiose or magnificent, but it's the kind of thing, whatever it is, we don't tend to give as much airtime to as the things we can complain about. That's why it's a stretch. So in just those ways, loving kindness practice is about paying attention differently, paying attention differently to ourselves, not just our faults and our problems, but wishing ourselves well, paying attention differently to others, not a fragmented attention or a fractured attention, but really being fully present with someone else in our mind as we are offering these phrases, which leads to being able to be fully present in life itself. Paying attention to the people we usually look right through. You know, there's, there's a category in formal loving kindness practice where uh, there are categories, you know, you offer loving kindness to yourself. And then as I mentioned before, a benefactor, a being you feel grateful for their existence and you go down these different categories till you get to all beings everywhere. So there's one called um, loving kindness for a neutral person, which has always sort of sneakily been my favorite. Um, a neutral person is someone we don't especially like or dislike. We just kind of indifferent to them. And probably for 45 years, my colleagues and I have been saying, 
the kind of person we usually objectify, we usually look through instead of at, like the checkout person in the supermarket. So sort of in the height of the pandemic, I was reading loud uh, loving kindness meditation that was being recorded on Zoom. And I got to that place and I said, like the checkout person in the supermarket. And I thought, don't we call them essential workers now? And maybe we're, you know, we're supposed to have a different sense of appreciation. And what about interconnection? And but it's true, we usually look right through certain people. And the question of loving kindness or the question it poses is what's our experience when we look at them instead of through them? Because that's what we're doing with the phrases. We're not trying to force or manufacture a certain special feeling. We're changing the way we pay attention and then we see what happens. Sometimes what happens is quite emotional. Sometimes it's not emotional at all, but it's still very powerful. To realize this is a human being like I am, who wants to be happy like I do, who has a story, I don't know what it is, but there's something because nobody has it all together. And we wish them well. So we have the central object, um, which they say in any one moment of doing that practice can be one of three things. It can be the phrase, may you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease or whatever phrases you're using. It can be the sense of the recipient. Sometimes the sense of the recipient is very acute. Sometimes it's very vague and we need to sharpen it. Like uh, you feel a little half asleep or something. And so you try to get a better sense either visually or just say the being's name or you just get a feeling for them. And sometimes there is a feeling, you know, there's just a kind of warmth or sense of closeness um, or caring. Uh, but the bottom line is the phrases because the feeling may or may not be there. The sense of the recipient may not be the sharpest thing going, but we can always have the phrases and they mean something. So without trying to force a feeling, we, we gather all of our attention behind one phrase at a time, just like we did for one breath at a time. And the skill set's really the same. Our minds wander, we let go, we come back. And in the process, there is not only the development of concentration, there's the fascinating evolution of loving kindness. They're actually, um, as we sort of referenced before, there are four qualities that are taught together. Um, one is loving kindness, which I define as a deep sense of connection because it doesn't mean you like somebody. Um, it doesn't mean you're gonna spend any time with them. And the literal translation of the word in Pali, the language of the original Buddhist text, uh, that word is metta, M-E-T-T-A. Uh, the literal translation is friendship, but I tend not to use it because um, As I was saying earlier, loving kindness is like a heart quality. It doesn't mean you're gonna hang out with somebody. You know, we want our hearts to be free, not to be obsessed with someone else's faults, which I'll get to in a minute in response to the question. But at the same time, there's discernment, there's intelligence, there's wisdom. Maybe it's not safe to be with this person. Maybe the balance of loving kindness for yourself and that other person says, stay away. Maybe it's not the right time. Maybe you don't know what to do, you know, uh, but you want your heart to stay connected nonetheless. So that's why I tend to use connection rather than friendship, but friendship is the literal translation. The second quality is compassion, which of course is very close to loving kindness and it's a word we use synonymously in conversation. 
but um, they're just kind of fine or subtle differences also. Like with loving kindness, some of it rests on the understanding that everybody wants to be happy. We all really want to be happy and we're so confused and we make so many mistakes and we're told so many odd things, you know, <laughs> like endless accumulation will make you happy or trouncing everybody else will make you happy. Um, it takes a lot to really figure out where genuine happiness lies, but we all share that urge. Compassion is more based on, it's just got a, like a little different flavor. You know, it's more based on um, the recognition that we're all vulnerable. Like not that we all share the same degree of suffering because we don't, but life is so fragile. It's so insecure, it's so changeable for everybody. So that compassion acknowledges that and, and we respond. The third quality um, is called sympathetic joy, and that's having joy in the happiness of others. Instead of witnessing someone's success or good fortune and falling sway to the voice that so often arises within that says, ooh, you know, I wish you had a little bit less going for you right now. Well, you don't have to lose everything, but if the light could just dim a bit, I'd feel better. So instead of falling into that, we're actually happy for someone else's happiness. We don't feel threatened by it. We don't feel ripped off because of it. And it's hard, you know, as a quality. I mean, some people, of course, I'm sure you probably know people who just have it naturally. It's like something good happens for you and they're so happy for you. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful quality. For most of us, it's not that natural. You know, because we need to confront or challenge a lot of assumptions that we hold, like um, the one I used earlier, I have nothing and I will forever. And you, you have everything and you will forever. So of course there are several problems with that. Nothing is forever. It's unlikely I have absolutely nothing. I may have nothing much I appreciate, or take the time to notice, but it's unlikely it's nothing. It's also unlikely you have everything, absolutely everything, because life's not like that, however much we pretend. So if we get to that place, you know, rather than being envious or jealous, then it's, it's incredibly liberating. And then the fourth quality is equanimity. So we have loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity, which we talked about before. Equanimity in this context is the voice of wisdom. It's bringing the quality of wisdom, which means boundaries, balance, into all of these interactions. Like we clearly want it present in compassion, right? Otherwise we become codependent and we feel we are responsible for someone else's decisions, which sadly we can't ever be. Or we become attached to a certain outcome, like, you know, in loving kindness, we use phrases like, may you be happy. And it's considered a practice of generosity. <clears throat> and we know that there are different ways of giving a gift. We can give a gift so it's a freely given gift. Like, enjoy this. Hope you enjoy this. It's another way of giving a gift with a lot of strings attached. Like, enjoy this. And then tell me by Tuesday, that's the best book you've ever read in your life. Maybe we get what we want, maybe we don't, you know. It's a different kind of generosity. So when we say, may you be happy with loving kindness, with metta practice, we would like it to be a freely given gift rather than I'm responsible for your happiness. I'm giving you to Wednesday. And you know, after Wednesday, you've got to hurry up, which is not exactly generosity, but is more like attachment. So we always need equanimity there. And even though it comes last on the list, 
there are certain systems um, in Buddhism that talk about it first, because you always want wisdom there. You always want balance there. And it only enriches the other three. We, we get afraid, I think, that it will diminish qualities like loving kindness and compassion, but really it only strengthens it because we have some perspective and uh, wisdom is not gonna hurt no matter what. And we want that, I believe, you know, we want um, as the recipients, like I've often said that I'm like, well, this, the image is actually out of Tibetan Buddhism. It comes from um, a meditation instruction which I don't tend to use as a meditation instruction, but more in this context, where they say, look at the thoughts and feelings that come up in your mind as though you were quite an elderly person sitting in a playground watching children play. So what does that mean? You're like quite an elderly person. You've seen a lot. You've probably had to let go of a lot. You've seen a lot of change in your life. And there you are in the playground. And you're seeing this little kid completely freak out because they broke a shovel. You're not all cold and mean, you know. You don't go up to the kid and say, kid, it's just a shovel. Wait till you have a real problem. You know, you're tender, you're caring, you're loving. And you also don't fall down on the ground sobbing. Because you know what? Shovels break. Bodies break, hearts break, lives break. That's in the nature of things, it's the truth. It's not that you don't care, you care tremendously, but you have perspective <clears throat> on things. And really, I think we want both. When I, as a human being, as an individual, I'm seeking help, I certainly don't want someone to say to me, it's just a shovel, you know, get over it. But I also, if somebody fell down on the ground sobbing, I totally freak out. Like, there's no way out. This is it. There's no hope, you know? In fact, somebody told me a story once about, um, he was in a swimming pool and he was having a panic attack and he thought he was having a heart attack. So he called 911 and the woman who answered the dispatcher was so hysterical and freaked out in response that he practically did have a heart attack. <laughs> You know, it was like, what, 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 you know? I think what we want, even if it's not verbal, is we want somebody who has a stance in a place that knows there's something bigger. There's a bigger truth in this universe than the immediate circumstance we are facing. And at the same time, it's totally present and caring and loving about that circumstance. And so that's how they combine really um, somebody asked a question in the chat uh, saying someone in my life is really trying to hurt me or fight with me I'm not engaging with her but I'm thinking about the situation <clears throat> constantly and it sucks do you know of some way I could reframe the situation so that I might suffer less uh, I think it's a really good question um, I don't know that it's necessarily a question of reframing, but reminding yourself of what you clearly already know. Um, <clears throat> somebody I know um, describes himself, I think quite accurately, as an obsessive type of person, especially in matters like this, like somebody behaves badly and they think about it 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 and they complain about it. And, and he was just uh, coming out of a bout of a time like this when he said to me, I think it's an AA phrase actually. He said, I let him live rent free in my brain for too long. And I was teaching the other day and somebody kept using the phrase I'm renting him a, a room in my brain. And I said, no, I think it's worse than that. I think you're not charging any rent. <laughs> you know, that's what I learned from my friends. Uh, and it does suck. It, we really suffer. And it's not like we did the thing to begin with, you know? Or, uh, and it's not like all of our 
uh, worry and fretting and complaining is actually going to change the behavior of somebody else. It is just making us miserable. So I would just try to see the pattern as it's emerging, recognizing what you're doing and practice everything you can to let go. Like sometimes it's a very gentle reminder, like it's not in my hands or that sometimes people combine phrases of compassion and phrases of equanimity. Like I, I, uh, I care about your suffering or I care about that action. I can't control it. Um, this is not mine, this is yours. Whatever it might be, it's a kind of form of play or experimenting to see what happens. Um, once I heard that somebody asked the Dalai Lama, um, in, in those uh, traditions and in the translations, they tend to use the word enemy a lot, you know, like one of the categories of loving kindness offering is a difficult person, somebody we find difficult, and they would tend to translate that as enemy. So um, someone else, the Dalai Lama about loving kindness for an enemy. Now, again, I want to say when we, if you want to practice loving kindness for a difficult person, it's not to make excuses for them or to pretend you like them or say what they did doesn't matter. Maybe it really matters a lot, but you don't want to have that burden anymore of the obsession, you know, being so caught in, in their action. So uh, it needs to be inspired, not driven, you know, not coerced if you're interested in playing in that realm. And, and it is play, we, we practice, um, being creative around it, you know, like maybe you offer loving kindness to them and you at the same time. So you don't feel like you're abandoning yourself or the texts say, can you imagine this person as an infant, totally helpless? Can you imagine them dying? Cause isn't that interesting? After everything, we all have to let go of everything. Or we extrapolate from that. People say things like, I imagine my difficult person on an island far, far away. There's food, like I'm not trying to starve them to death, but no bridge, no boat, no aqueduct, no way they can ever get close to me. And that's when I can do the practice. Or sometimes we change the phrases. Um, I remember somebody saying to me, he wanted to do loving kindness for his uh, previously very abusive mother. And he changed the phrases to be, may you be free of hatred. So the mark of success in the practice is that we're able to do the practice. Not that there's some great wave of loving feeling, but anyway, um, the Dalai Lama was once asked about loving kindness for an enemy. And he said, well, you know, if you just, if you get into that obsessed mode, you can't eat, you can't enjoy any food, you can't sleep. You can't enjoy doing anything. He said, why give them this satisfaction? You know, which I thought was very uh, New York and very cute. Um, why give them this satisfaction? So we're talking about our own freedom of mind here and the ability to um, exercise it. At the same time, finding the balance that we feel is, is important and realistic in any situation, whatever that might look like, which is why there's no exact formula. And that's another fear people have about loving kindness. Like if I were to practice loving kindness, I could only give you more money or I could only let you move back in or I can only be sweet and smile. So it's better to take it away from the realm of behavior altogether and just think about the free heart that can connect, uh, first of all, to ourselves in a loving and compassionate way, and, and then to others. So that is its own practice, um, which we'll do some of in a little bit. So once again, do you have any questions or comments? You can put questions in the chat, or you can, now that we're all pros, we can use the raise hand function 
which is under the something reactions, I think. Reactions. So Olivia has her hand up. Thank you. Hi, hey, Sharon. So I just started practicing loving kindness. I, I practice other type of meditation, but this is kind of new. So when I tried it on my own before the retreat, one thing is sometimes when I begin to say the phrase like, may you be safe, and initially it was fine, but later there is some mental image. It becomes to like play some movie and it gets scary because sometimes it plays a movie of this person. Imagine this person not safe which feels like the opposite, so I kind of freak out. I was like, oh, <laughs> I, I try to just stay with the sentence, but the image there makes me very uncomfortable. <laughs> so I wonder, yeah, any suggestions for things like yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you need to be scared of it. You're not like giving them bad energy or anything like that. But I, I think you might need to be more um, active, like maybe even enter the image, take their hand and move them to a safe place. Oh. You know, so rather than dwell on unsafe, what does safe look like? Um, or what does it feel like? Like if I was, when I was writing a loving kindness curriculum for school children, I had to really try to think about that. Like, uh, and I finally came up with, you know, if someone's holding your hand when you're crossing the street, and you feel really good about that. That's what safe feels like. That mm. that's what we want people to have. Uh, so it's I can take a more active stance in yeah, that's right. generating that's right. image. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Yeah. In the Brahma Viharas, that's these four qualities. What's the difference between Karuna and Metal? Um, that's the difference between loving kindness and compassion. There's there's overlap for sure. And the ways we use those words in English, they seem to be the same. They're, they're not exactly the same. Somebody once said, um, compassion is love that's looking at suffering. So it's just got a different flavor, you know, like when you're thinking about struggles somebody has, something happens in your heart, that's a little different than when you're thinking about them um, uh, meeting their grandchild for the first time or, you know, uh, having um, some real peace of mind. It's a different feeling, tone, but they're very connected. Um, and it's why, you know, the um, what's called the proximate cause in the Buddhist psychology, the nearest arising condition or the thing that if you put it into place will be a very likely springboard for the quality you're trying to develop. Not the only springboard, but a very likely one for loving kindness. It's reflecting on the fact that everybody, or the idea that everybody wants to be happy. Every one of us actually wants to be happy and we're so confused. And, and compassion, it's more about um, reflecting on how everyone is vulnerable. <clears throat> so compassion is also a very strongly misunderstood state. Um, you know, the English translation is to suffer with, and uh, not translation from Pali, translation from English, Old English. You know, that's what they'll say. Compassion means to suffer with. and. But here you got to ask about questions of balance. Like somebody wrote in the chat where I talk about empathy and compassion. Okay, so these are also two words that are confused from one another. The definition of compassion from the Pali, a definition, actually includes both of these. So um, empathy can be different kinds of empathy, but in the sense that it's usually talked about with compassion, it's a felt sense. It's like a resonance in your body when you see someone going through something. 
It's like something happens within, so you're almost mirroring it. It's reflected in your own body. You feel, oh, that, and it's not meant to be like an imposition, like I know exactly what you're going through, but you sense like, ooh, that's likely so uncomfortable. Like no one's talking to you. That must feel weird, you know? Like what would it be like? Or um, uh, your contribution is not being acknowledged in this project and you're just sitting there and you think, ooh, you know, like, so it's actually a feeling in your body. It's a resonance, right? It's a reflection. And that's crucial. I think we see a world in large measure without enough empathy. Like people are othered. We don't get that sense of, oh, I bet that hurts, you know? Or it's one thing to kick a table and knowing you're kicking a table. It's another thing to kick a human being or a creature and feel like you're kicking a table. Then we're really in trouble. You know, so we do see a world that can be very cold, very cruel, without a lot of empathy. Because um, beings get objectified, like it doesn't feel like it matters that they're being kicked. And yet it's not exactly the same as compassion because empathy is like a building block toward a possible state of compassion, which I'll describe in a minute. So the, the definition from the poly is for compassion is the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. So that's the empathy part. Our hearts actually tremble when we see pain or suffering. And then the next part is it's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. So that's the compassion part. It's not a movement into to burn up ourselves because then we can't help anybody, right? We're just all in a mess. It's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. Not like I'm in charge of the situation, I'm gonna fix everything because I'm the savior. So it's the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. It's a movement toward to see if I can be of help. So I see it as sequential. Like we need that feeling of empathy. We need something that has us care, you know, about the situation we are witnessing. But maybe we have a genuine moment of empathy and it frightens us. So we just want to run away. Or maybe we have that moment of empathy, but we're so tired anyway. We're so exhausted. We just don't feel the wherewithal to respond. And we know this from everyday life. You know, it's sometimes like you haven't slept, you've got a lot going on, you're really stressed out and someone starts telling you their rather sad story and all you're thinking is go away, you know, please go away. It's like you cannot take it in because you don't have that sense of resource. Or maybe um, I met this therapist once um, and you're from all over. I usually try to hasten to say, I'm sure he's never been your therapist, uh, who told me that he went through a period about six months long where he just blamed his, his patients, his clients for everything. Like they would be telling him a story and he'd think, I told you six months ago what to do. If you'd only listen, you'd be a lot better off. So that's one possible response to sensing that moment of empathy. Or we may get into that strange savior thing. I'm gonna fix it. I am the one. I'm gonna make everything okay. Or we might respond with compassion a movement toward to see if we can be of help. So there's so much implied in that definition. Balance, maybe balance of compassion toward ourselves and others. Compassion, the balance of compassion and wisdom to see if we can be of help. Because go back to the model of generosity. And we use material generosity because it's so concrete, it's an easy, way to understand some of these principles. We would like so much to give somebody a gift and have them dance with delight and say, that's like the best sweater I've ever gotten. I don't care if it's August, I'm putting it on, you know, or I can't believe that book, you know, it's like saved my life. It's, like, it's gonna save everyone's life, but we can't count on that, can we? 
And we give hopefully from as generous and free a place as possible. Would that we lived in a world where we can insist, you know, you're gonna say exactly what I need you to say. That'd be nice. But it's not like that. It just isn't. And so wisdom means seeing reality. It's seeing the truth of things. So we want that balance. That's the way of sustaining compassion, sustaining generosity. Otherwise, it's all too disappointing, you know? And, or we get impatient. Like things may be working really the way we want them to, but not as quickly as we want them to. You know, so uh, compassion is implying that, which is why like researchers and different people don't like the phrase compassion fatigue because they say it's really empathy fatigue, you know, but we call it compassion fatigue because we confuse those two words. But there is like a growing body of science about the difference between empathy and compassion. Some people say the different regions of the brain actually that get involved and um, we need both and we can have empathy without compassion. I learned that because when empathy training was starting to get more popular in the States um, as though it were the ultimate answer, I kept thinking about the people who I have spent more and more time working with in meditation who we call caregivers, who I, you know, I always think it's not the right word, but it's either in their personal lives and their families or their professional lives. They are taking care of someone else. They are living on the front lines of suffering. They're trying to deal with intractable systems. And I, and they're burning out at some phenomenal rate. And I kept thinking, these people have plenty of empathy. They don't need more empathy. You know, there's something else going on that's producing such massive burnout and exhaustion, which has more to do with balance and so on. So, um, you know, that's when I got really uh, interested in, in understanding, you know, what is scientifically known as the difference between empathy and compassion. Um, sometimes people refer to compassion in a way that includes a level of patronizing, that's true. Like poor thing versus we relate and we know suffering as well. That's very true. Like many people think of compassion as a kind of hierarchical state. Like I, whose life is so together and bestowing this kindness on you way down there, whose life has fallen apart because mine never ever could. Well, guess what? It could. So compassion, genuine compassion is much more kind of equality state where we resonate. We do feel into and we know that life is so fragile for everybody. And it, it's much more kind of equal state what can we do when it feels uncomfortable and we struggle to give, receive loving kindness for ourselves? Yes, it's a struggle. Um, I'm laughing because in the tradition, the underlying principle of loving kindness practice as a method of meditation is that it's meant to be done in the easiest way possible. And so that's when the sequence unfolds. There is a classical sequence. You can't do it all in one sitting. It's way too cramped, you know, like fitting it all in. But over time, you want to hit loving kindness for yourself and a benefactor, that person who's helped you, a friend. Maybe sometimes we um, differentiate a friend who's doing well right now. So it becomes like, a little sympathetic joy meditation, a friend who's not doing so well right now. So it becomes like a compassion meditation. So it's yourself, a benefactor, a friend, a neutral person, like the person who works in the store that you frequent or you don't even know their name. 
a difficult person, and then all beings everywhere, all of life. So again, it's not all meant to be in one sitting or one session, but over time, we experiment with offering loving kindness to all these categories of beings. And the way the unfolding is said to be governed is doing it in the easiest way possible. And so they say, start with yourself because you are supposed to be the easiest, which is not always the case, you know? It's an interesting reflection on, I guess, Indian society 2,600 years ago. Um, and so I always, always just go back to the principle. I say, it doesn't matter, you know, start with the benefactor, start with the puppy, start with who's easiest. You have to include yourself at some point. You can't go forever without including yourself, but do it later. You know, people say to me, I could do loving kindness for all beings everywhere. And then I pop up like a, an old pop-up ad in a computer. And then I could offer loving kindness to myself. Or there are many instances, just like with a difficult person, where I said, we play, like imagine them on an island and they can't get to you, you know. We play when we offer loving kindness to ourselves. Uh, maybe you're young, maybe you're um, doing the thing you're hang gliding or the thing you would never ever do in real life, you know. <laughs> like, uh, we have fun, you know, and, and get creative. Or, um, you use certain phrases or um, there are practices where you imagine uh, starting with like a deeply loving person. Could be, or doesn't have to be a person. Could be the puppy. Could be a, a teacher. Could be someone you've never met, but who in your own heart is the symbol of loving energy and they're offering loving kindness to you. And you use phrases like, may you be safe, because it's coming from them to you. And then uh, an extrapolation of that is imagining yourself in the center of a circle. And the circle is made up of all of these loving beings. And again, you are the recipient. and. Uh, you need to have a good sense of humor and an ability to kind of look at your mind and not freak out because it wouldn't be uncommon. And certainly I experienced it in the center of that circle to think this is the last place in the world I want to be. You know, can't they pay attention to one another and forget about me? And I just wanted to duck down. I mean, some people feel gratitude, but a lot of times it's embarrassing. I don't like it, you know. But practicing, and it's a practice, having those feelings like wash through you as you steady your attention on the phrases, it makes a difference. Um, I found loving kindness practice very, very powerful. Which is why I began teaching it uh, right away in 1985. Um, like any practice, you know, it's difficult because you don't see immediate results. And, you know, uh, I would say, especially in loving kindness practice, you likely will not see the results in that formal period of, let's say, 20 minutes a day where you're practicing, but you'll see it where it counts, which is in your life. We don't ever think to look there. You know, oh, I said that stupid thing and I forgave myself so much more readily and could move on. Or I met a stranger and I was not so weirdly self-preoccupied, but I could actually take an interest in them. Or this happened or that happened, or, you know, uh, it actually does work. Uh, and it's a very, very powerful transformation of a lot of people's lives. So if you can uh, pursue it and be patient with it, you know, you will see a lot of changes, um, even in receiving loving kindness for ourselves. I sometimes tell the story about Ramdas, who was a close friend of mine. I met him in my first retreat. And then, you know, years and years later, he had a very severe stroke and he was uh, living on Maui. And uh, 
still teaching, living in a wheelchair with big time aphasia and difficulty speaking. And he was giving a talk and I was sitting in the back of the room with 300 people and he was saying that the hardest thing of all from his stroke was having to receive help. And I'd known him since January, 1971. And I'd say, absolutely true. You know, he was a giver, he was a helper. He was always taking care of others. It was really, really painful for him to receive anything. And then he had a stroke. And he said, harder than the physical pain, harder than living in a wheelchair, harder than his difficulties with speech was receiving help. And he said, it was the most difficult thing and it was the most liberating. And you could tell those last years of his life, it was almost like there was a barrier within him which had dissolved and he was just transparent. He was like made of light. And it was just love going in both directions. And he said up on that stage, he said, one of my famous books was called, How Can I Help? And he said, now I feel like writing a book called, How Can You Help Me? You know, which was very sweet. Um, we can we can get that transparent. We really can. Um, what are phrases of comfort to offer directly to someone who's suffering and vulnerable, and you feel empathy and compassion? And they are needing comforting. I can get that reaction like, please don't go there today. I can't handle it. And they get to the place of nothing is okay and will never be. Um, I mean, I think there are different of phrases that you use in your own practice and phrases that you verbally offer to somebody. Perhaps uh, what we say to somebody, I think only matters in the sense of, um, I guess it was Maya Angelou's famous quote, which I'm not gonna to get totally correctly. Like people won't remember what you say, they'll remember how you made them feel. You know, so you're not gonna get it right anyway. Things are really, really hard. And somebody's needing comforting in that, in that degree, but you can be there. It's your presence. Um, and in fact, the less you say and the more you listen or just are there, I think the better off everybody is. Uh, because you're not making any assumptions, you're just really there to see what happens. Um, sometimes, I mean, there's a, an underlying, I think, truth in your in your question that sometimes things we do or things we say to try to help somebody inadvertently puts a kind of pressure on them. Like I remember that again with Ramdas right after his stroke, when he was still living in California and you know, he'd been such an important figure for a lot of people and people were uh, beautifully and generously sending him these things after a stroke, uh, herbs and ointments and all kinds of things. And it was a beautiful, beautiful gesture, but sometimes they would arrive with a note and I would bet anything that the internal experience of receiving it was one of pressure. Like take 15 drops of this a day and you'll definitely be walking in two weeks. And I could just, I could feel it, you know, like what if it doesn't work? Well, I have failed you. What about now I need to take care of you? And, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you won't be here anymore. If, if I'm not walking in two weeks, what if your thing doesn't work? You do you abandon me? Where's the love, right? So when I was there, visit, the first time I visited him in California after he got out of the hospital, one of those kinds of things arrived and it was a bottle of Ganges water, water from the Ganges River. And it had one of those notes, like just take 15 drops of this a day and you'll definitely be walking again. I said, don't drink that. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't drink that. You'll get cholera if you drink that. You know, so it's both. It's beautiful and generous and genuinely so and for, for us, you know, as the so-called helper, we have to see when it's more about our own satisfaction than just trying to be there for somebody. 
in terms of phrases for uh, your internal work, you know, for the meditation, I would just trust your intuition, you know, like, um, and, and see what arises, just like that man with his mother came to maybe for your hatred. You know, that was, that was his own process and evolving that phrase. So uh, I, would, I would really trust that. And, and as for the rest, it's not what you say, it's your being there and how you make someone, help someone feel is what they're gonna remember. Okay, so when we do loving kindness practice, we're offering these phrases to a variety of beings, starting with ourselves, perhaps. We gather all of our attention behind one phrase at a time. When our attention wanders, we see if we can let go and come back. We're not trying to force any kind of feeling but the power of the practice is in that complete wholehearted gathering. I'm gonna guide you through just one possible variation of many possible variations. You might take like a five minute break first if you wanna stretch. Um, yeah, so why don't we do that and come back in five minutes, we'll, uh, do the loving kindness practice and I'll describe phrases and so on, okay? Okay, so uh, we'll do a few minutes of loving kindness practice. Some of you may have phrases that you're accustomed to using and that's totally fine. The idea of the phrases is that they need to be kind of general so that um, you're not constantly thinking, what about you, what about you, what about you? And sometimes as in the cases we talked about, the phrases do change with the particular recipient, but you don't want them to constantly change all the time. So that's why they are very general, like may you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Live with ease means in the things of day-to-day -day life, like livelihood and family, may not be such a struggle. May you live with ease, may you be safe. Be happy, be healthy, live with ease. The feeling tone is gift giving or generosity. It's like a blessing, you're making an offering. And we start classically, as I said, with ourselves. So we'll give it a try. If it's a struggle, please just move on to a benefactor. But in starting with ourselves, it, of course this phrase, may I, May I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And, and people sometimes say to me, who am I asking? We're not asking anybody anything, we're offering, we're gift giving. So you can sit comfortably, again, close your eyes or not, however you wish. 
and just begin repeating the phrases that you're using over and over again with enough space and enough silence so that it's a rhythm that's pleasing to you. May I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And when you find your attention has wandered, it's okay. See if you can let go and just come back to the phrases. And see if you can bring a benefactor here. It's someone who's helped you. Maybe they've helped you directly. Maybe you've never met them. They've inspired you from afar. It's like an embodiment of the force of love for you. It could be an adult, could be a child, could be a pet. Who makes you smile? So if someone comes to mind, you can say their name to yourself or get an image of them. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. Even if the words don't seem really perfect, they're carrying the heart's energy, so they're serving us. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease.
And let's offer loving kindness to a friend. How about a friend who's not doing so well right now? Who's struggling in some way? Bring them here. Let's see what happens as you offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. And let's have a gathering. Let's just see who shows up. Friends, family, colleagues, puppies. And we'll offer loving kindness to the collective. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease.
And then all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, near and far, known and unknown, may all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes, or lift your gaze, and we'll end the meditation. So thank you so much for spending the day with me in practice with one another. Um, and I don't know, Eva, if you have any closing announcements as we depart and go on and spread loving kindness throughout the world. <laughs> uh, just one reminder, uh, Inside LA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the generosity of our community to continue making offering like this, inviting uh, Sharon to come and teach today and to make the teaching accessible to everyone regardless of the situation. And so if you haven't had the chance to offer any dana yet for today's event, uh, please visit the donation link. I will drop that in the chat. And uh, no amount is too small, and we are grateful for any contributions. So thank you for practicing with us today. Thank you very much. May you be well and happy. Nice. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. 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 Thank you.